the human brain, an amazingly complex and extraordinary electrical and chemical universe composed of over 200 billion nerve cells, each individual in purpose and unique in function, each interweaving and joining to form an enchanted loom of over a quadrillion connections. The human brain, a three-pound mass of pinkish-gray tissue that would hardly rate the second glance of a casual observer, yet within its dark furrows, folds and chambers, lies the divine spark of light that gives animated life to the human body and the power of raw, godlike intelligence to the mind. The power that allows man to think, reason, and feel, comprehend, understand, and remember, desire, create, and achieve, the energized substance that enables one to transform thought into action and vision into reality. The human brain is a high-powered optical processor that can quickly retrieve from its depths of memory any chosen amount of the billions of pieces of information that comes in through the eyes and senses during each waking second. In the act of retrieval, it can replay three-dimensionally in the mind's eye all of the vividness, sensory richness, feeling, and emotion associated with the original memory event. This unique ability of the human brain to form rich, emotion-provoking visual images is what separates man from animal. It is this internal light of the mind, this language of the brain, which we call intelligence, creative power, and imagination. Eighty years ago, the distinguished British novelist Joseph Conrad wrote, The mind of man is capable of anything, because everything is in it, all of the past as well as all of the future. Today, thanks to a growing body of scientific knowledge, we now know that the brain is not only the storehouse of knowledge, but is literally the key to our success or failure in life. Achieving our goals and our heart's desire is not determined primarily by outside influences, but by our own mind and the images we create and store within it. Some people, of course, have instinctively known this. For example, Henry J. Kaiser, one of the world's most successful industrialists, first attained every one of his business successes in his vivid imagination, long before they became a reality. The basic laws that govern modern physics and that are the very foundation of our world's technological developments were first visualized in the mind of an uneducated 16-year-old boy who imagined himself riding on a beam of light as it traveled through space at 186,000 miles per second. This young man, Albert Einstein, later clothed his sensory impressions of that imaginary ride through space in mathematical terms, formulating the theory of relativity. Wolfgang Mozart, one of the world's great composers, saw, heard, and felt each masterpiece in his mind before it was composed on paper. Michelangelo attributed his genius in sculpture to his ability to first envision in raw marble a detailed, three-dimensional image of the work he had first conceived in his mind. History is replete with examples of great achievers who equated their power of success with their ability to first formulate in their mind's eye an intensely vivid, sensory detailed image of that which they desired to create, possess, and achieve. Everything that man has ever accomplished and achieved, every great work, every discovery, first existed in someone's mind in the form of a vivid image. Every act, every deed that has enabled man to progress and motivated him to excel and achieve was first born three-dimensionally in the mind. Not only do mental images exert influence over man's creative self, they also have tremendous power over his body. Our bodies react to mental images in ways similar to how they react to images from the outside, concrete world. Edmund Jacobson, an American physiologist, has shown that if you can graphically picture yourself running, for example, feeling the strain of the muscles in your legs, feeling the blood rushing through your body to energize and nourish it, sensing your heart rate accelerating to maximum capacity, that during this imagery exercise alone, the muscles in your body will actually undergo subtle but measurable contractions comparable to the changes that occur during actual physical running. 
In the same way, if you can vividly imagine yourself biting into a large, ripe, juicy, sour lemon, sensing the juice squirting over your tongue and cheeks, and cringing at its bitter, unpleasant taste, you will literally begin to salivate. Or by creating the vision of a vicious, rabid, jaw-clenching pit bull dog chasing you, barking ferociously, and finally tearing at your clothes as it overtakes you, your blood pressure and heart rate will increase, and you may begin to perspire and break out with goosebumps on your arms. Recently, research has shown that people can have extraordinary control over the parts of their body whose functions were previously thought to be under involuntary control. Yoga masters have demonstrated the ability to raise their heart rates from 80 to over 300 beats per minute, as well as raise their body temperature to instantaneously melt ice with a touch of a hand. Their ability to accomplish such feats were shown to be made up of vivid, sensory-enriched visualization. Many medical doctors have adapted the visualization technique for their disease-afflicted patients, having them picture themselves as healthy, disease-free individuals. These doctors often guide their patients into imagining that their white blood cells are white knights, attacking and destroying their diseases and malignancies. One cancer doctor has his patients visualize their cancer as chopped up hamburger meat and their white blood cells as dogs devouring and destroying the hamburger. The doctors who incorporate these visualization techniques into their daily practice routine have reported incredible results with their patients, results that defy traditional medical statistics. Images held intently in the mind can literally affect every cell in the human body. Besides affecting our bodies, imagery has power over our lives, affecting our attitudes, how people react to us, and the opportunities made available for us to achieve our hopes and aspirations. Have you ever noticed that when you wake up with a cheerful disposition, with a positive attitude toward yourself and high expectations of the coming day, that your sensory impressions actually manifest themselves in the external world? People you meet seem to be more cheerful and happy or become so in your presence. Events that draw your attention seem to be positive or you tend to see something positive in them. A person who is sensitive to this cause and effect relationship feels intuitively that almost like magic, any pure image that he can hold in his mind will eventually manifest itself into a physical, concrete reality. The effects may extend beyond day-to-day -day events into the future. For example, a person who has held in his mind a vivid image of a dream house in the countryside, he can see, hear, touch, taste, smell, and sense emotionally in exquisite details all of the elements associated with the country house. This person may find that through no conscious effort of his own that such an opportunity to acquire the home avails itself to him. And many of the characteristics of his new country environment correspond to the image he held originally in the past. Taking visualization and its power one step further, Physicists have begun to study body energy and its effects on the world outside of the body. Numerous experiments have been conducted that clearly illustrate that visual images embellished with the rich sensory detail of sound, touch, taste, smell, and fired with emotion can produce measurable energy that directly affects objects in the physical world. The researchers also found that if the images were vague, lacking in detail and feeling, they possessed no power to impact upon matter. An ancient biblical scripture writer spoke a profound truth when he wrote, As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Positive and wishful thinking, artificial hype and external motivation alone, will not produce the power to change your internal and external world. Only thinking in your heart, heartfelt, sensory-inspired, three-dimensional visualization is the key to your power. If you can think in your heart, allowing yourself to make full contact with every one of your personal and professional aspirations, seeing them, hearing, touching, tasting, and smelling them, and sensing the strong emotions that accompany their ultimate fulfillment, you will burn them indelibly into your brain and nervous system and create a force internally and in the external world for their realization. The richer and more intense your dreams become, 
the better your chances for success. If an image we hold in our mind ultimately expresses itself in concrete reality, then each of us possesses the power of creation, the power to make of our lives that which we desire, the power to create a personal inner and outer world that is rich in purpose and content, a world that is laced with achievement and success. Vivid, sensory-rich visualization is the mechanism of this creation. The ability to translate one's hopes and aspirations into sensory-rich images is the cutting edge that separates the high achiever from the mundane, average, run-of-the-mill person. Ask the high achiever to describe to you his goals, triumphs, and successes. He will paint for you with his words a three-dimensional picture of his past, present, and future. Through his description, you feel as if you were there with him as he describes to you in rich detail the glory of his life's victories, and he inspires you to want to be there with him for tomorrow's battles. His sensory-rich images have always been the source of his inner drive and motivation, and when he reaches his goals, their realization seems to merely echo a reality that has already existed three-dimensionally in his mind. By contrast, ask the average underachiever to describe to you his successes. He can only recite to you a sensory-rich, detail-by-detail, blow-by-blow account of his failures and give you three-dimensional excuses as to why he failed. The underachiever uses the power of visualization negatively. His fears, anxieties, worries, and anger are embodied and weighted with strong sensory impressions because it is much easier for him to concretely picture and pre-live their eventual outcome. Ask the underachiever to explain to you his goals, hopes, and aspirations, and his mental canvas turns to a vague, unorganized collage of meaningless scribbles. Such a task of positive sensing is nearly impossible for the underachiever, who so keenly senses and fears failure. The act of visualization and the resultant power that the image possesses to influence one's body, mind, and environment has mystified and intrigued mystics, philosophers, and poets throughout history. For thousands of years, man has yearned to know what it is that enables him to see, with his eyes closed, the same detailed images that reflect the reality he perceives with his eyes open. What is it that enables you, for example, as you now listen to this audio cassette tape, to easily see yourself sitting in front of a warm fireplace on a cold winter's evening, or going to your bedroom, walking over to your bed, and turning back the covers? In a quick instant, you can then be behind the wheel of your car, caught up in rush hour traffic. Then, in another moment, you can be in your office, talking on the telephone, or in the produce section of a supermarket, scanning over rows of fresh fruits and vegetables. What is it that allowed you to transport yourself back through time, to move yourself freely from image to image, from scene to scene, to recreate any part of your life's experience as the appropriate words triggered the memory flow? What is this inner vision? What is the strange chemistry that ferments inside the brain which allows us to see with our mind's eye? And what energy force is it that transforms a vivid image held in our imaginations into concrete reality. No other personal success program has ever attempted to answer or even address these critical questions. In the Neuropsychology of Achievement, we will, for the first time, give you a complete understanding behind the phenomenon of visualization, how and why it occurs in the brain and nervous system, and from where it draws its tremendous powers. Through advances in the brain sciences, physics, and mathematics, the age-old phenomenon of visualization can be easily explained and simply understood. Armed with this knowledge, you will have power. You will have the power to take full control of your life and have greater control of the circumstances around you. With this knowledge, you'll be able to harness the same powers of body and mind that have inspired and guided all of the world's great achievers to high levels of personal and professional achievement. While many self-improvement programs tell you how you ought to be, but stop short of guiding you through the peaks and valleys of the long-term self-actualization process, the Neuropsychology of Achievement program will take you through every step in the process. In effect, this program begins where others stop. 
ensuring you that you'll learn to successfully utilize all of the new scientific breakthroughs that it incorporates. Drawing upon universities and research centers from New York to California, we have analyzed, synthesized, and consolidated the information from countless numbers of studies and have created the most sophisticated approach yet that will help you achieve every one of your worthwhile personal and professional goals. As you learn through this program to maximize your mind's potential, the positive results are likely to both surprise and delight you. Now let's dig into the meat of the program by answering the questions regarding visualization. What is visualization? How is a visual image formed in the mind? And from where do visual images generate their power to affect matter and to transform themselves into concrete reality? The answers to these questions lie in gaining an understanding of the nature of the brain. In man's attempt to understand the brain, there has been a tendency to model the brain on the latest technology. During the latter half of the 19th century, for example, the brain was supposed to resemble a steam engine with instincts that built up pressures and release valves that relieved them. In the early 20th century, the brain was compared to a telephone switchboard. Following the Second World War, brain functioning was modeled on a cybernetic guidance and control system with servo mechanisms and feedback loops. When digital computers became popular, the brain became an information processing system whose inputs and outputs were controlled by one computer and then later by two computers. The computer-like brain was built upon logic and possessed memory storage and access to that memory. All of these models for viewing the nature of the brain shed significant light on our understanding of brain function, but they all fell exceedingly short in explaining the most basic phenomenon of the brain, the brain's ability to store billions upon billions of visual images in its memory and its ability to recreate those images in their full visual and sensory detail within the mind's eye. Is there such a model that we can draw from technology that will help us explain these unique powers of the brain, the puzzle of visualization that has inspired mystics for thousands of years and has eluded scientists for nearly as long? Dr. Carl Prebram, a distinguished Stanford University neurosurgeon psychologist, is one of the most respected brain researchers in the world, who is often referred to as the Einstein of the brain sciences. Dr. Prebram has proposed that the hologram, a three-dimensional image projected into space, recreated from interference patterns of laser light, provides the long sought after model of how visual and sensory information is received, distributed, stored, and recalled by the brain. Not only does the hologram provide us with a new meaningful metaphor to help us understand the age-old mysteries of the brain, Dr. Prebram also believes that there is enough laboratory evidence available to demonstrate a physiological, biological, and mathematical basis for the model. Or in other words, the theory of the holographic brain is supported by hardcore scientific evidence. Before we go into any further detail on the nature of the holographic brain and how it provides us with the answers to the mysteries of visualization, it is important for you to first gain a basic understanding of what a hologram is, how it works, and to learn about some of its fascinating characteristics. Then, after you have acquired a simple understanding of holographic theory, you'll learn how and why the hologram is the perfect technological model for understanding the complex human brain. And then finally, once you're armed with this knowledge, we'll together begin to explain, unfold, and understand the mysteries of the human brain. If you have never seen a holographic image, it at first may be difficult to visualize exactly what it is and how it looks through only a verbal explanation. But with some simple explanation mixed with imagination, you'll be able to picture accurately in your mind's eye what a hologram looks like. So as I explain, close your eyes for a moment and follow along with me in your imagination. Pretend that you are sitting in a dark room in your house, quietly reflecting upon a peaceful subject. As you gaze ahead into the dark ether of the room, an apparition or a ghost-like image suddenly appears, suspended in midair, a few feet before your eyes. For a moment, you think you're hallucinating, thinking perhaps you shouldn't have eaten those wild mushrooms you picked earlier that evening from your yard. As you look closer, you see that the apparition 
is in the image of your wife. If you're a woman, pretend it's your husband. This is ridiculous, you think. This certainly couldn't be your wife because she is visiting at her mother's for three days. But she appears so real, so well-defined, that you reach out to touch her. As you reach out with your hand, you feel nothing. Your hand passes right through her image. Perplexed, you walk around this three-dimensional image and discover that you can view it from all sides and from top to bottom. Then, in a near state of panic, you hear coming from the back of the room the imp-like mocking laugh of your spouse. Suddenly, the lights in the room flash on, dissolving the ghost-like image. Then, as you slowly gain your composure and look around the room, you see your full-bodied, real-life wife standing in the doorway, laughing hysterically at your reaction to the sudden appearance of her ghostly image. Then she explains to you that instead of going to her mother's, she went upstate to the university for a two-day course in holography. And as a part of the course, the teacher created her holographic image on a film plate, and she thought it would be a good practical joke to come home a day sooner than you expected and to scare the daylights out of you by projecting her holographic image. Okay, now go ahead and open your eyes. In our imaginary example, the lifelike three-dimensional image you saw suspended before you in space is what a holographic image really looks like. In holography, the image of a subject literally cannot be distinguished from the real and material three-dimensional object. How is a holographic image recorded, stored, and played back? The method of holography is basically a two-step process, very much like photography. In photography, if you want to reproduce an image of an apple, for example, the apple would first be illuminated by natural light or a flash gun. A portion of the light that illuminated the apple is reflected off of the apple and toward the camera. This reflected light passes through of the camera where the image of the apple is focused onto a light-sensitive film. The film is then developed with a chemical process that allows the image to emerge on the film. The resultant photograph is two-dimensional. In contrast to photography, if you were to take a holographic image of an apple, you would need, besides the apple, what we call in holography the object, the following materials. A source of laser light, a laser beam splitter, a mirror, and a photographic plate. To record the image of the apple holographically, the following events would occur. First, you would turn on your laser. This produces a red, pencil-thin beam of light. The light would be aimed at the beam splitter, a half-silvered mirror that is resting in front of the laser. This beam splitter divides the beam into two separate beams. One beam is aimed straight ahead at the apple. This beam is called the object beam. As this beam of red, pencil-thin light hits the apple, the apple interferes with the straight projection of the beam. This interference causes the beam to be broken up into wave-like patterns, much like the wave pattern that is created when you drop a pebble into a pond. These waves of light then travel from the apple toward the film plate. Your second beam of light, called the reference beam, is aimed at a mirror that is angled toward the film plate. The light from this second beam is deflected off of the mirror and travels toward the film plate. Before the object beam, the beam bouncing off the apple, and the reference beam, the beam deflected off the mirror, reach the film plate, they collide with each other. This collision of the two beams of light creates wave-like interference patterns. This collision creates an effect similar to dropping two pebbles into a pond creating concentric circles or waves that radiate out of each pebble. When the two sets of waves run into each other, they form an interference pattern. Where the crest of the waves meet, they make a wave that is twice as high. If a wave meets a trough, the two will cancel each other out to form a flat patch. If two troughs meet, they will make a deep trough. When two laser beams meet, they produce an interference pattern of light and dark. This interference pattern is recorded on the film plate. The film is then developed using normal photographic chemicals. In ordinary light, the developed film plate looks uniformly a silvery gray. Looking at the film plate, you cannot see the image of the apple, but only a barely visible complex of swirling wave patterns of gray and white. 
The key to reproducing the three-dimensional image of the apple is the reference beam. The process of holographic reproduction is like solving an algebraic equation. If you aim the reference beam at the developed film plate at the same angle as the original reference beam, it is possible to solve the equation. To crack the code of swirling gray and white bands and reconstruct the original image of the apple. By shining the reference beam through the recorded interference patterns on the film, the waveforms will unravel themselves into a three-dimensional image suspended in space, an image that can be viewed and studied from different angles. If you are not familiar with holography, and this is the first time you have ever heard an explanation of what a hologram is and how it is produced, at this point you might be a little confused. But don't dismay. To make this process as clear as possible, open up your Neuropsychology of Achievement study guide to the first module titled Your Holographic Brain, The Power of Three-Dimensional Visualization, and refer to the illustration How a Hologram Works as I go through the explanation once again. I'll pause here for a moment while you locate the illustration. Okay, ready? A laser is the purest source of light available. It is of a single wavelength and color. To produce a hologram, a beam of laser light emanating from a laser source is divided by a beam splitter into two separate beams. One of these beams, the object beam, travels in a straight line to the object, in this case an apple, which it illuminates, bounces off of, and travels toward an undeveloped light-sensitive film plate. The other beam, the reference beam, is aimed at a mirror angled toward the film plate, deflected off the mirror, and continues on toward the film plate as well. Before reaching the film plate, the two beams, the object beam and the reference beam, collide with each other. This collision creates wave-like interference patterns, and it is these swirling patterns that are recorded on the film plate. The film plate is then developed using normal photographic chemicals. Looking at the developed film plate, the naked eye barely perceives the unintelligible swirling gray and white interference patterns created by the collision of the object and reference beams of laser light. To reconstruct a three-dimensional image of the apple, the object, all that needs to be done is to direct a second reference beam at the developed film plate that is at the same angle as the first reference beam. Once illuminated with the reference beam, the once silvery gray film blossoms forth an image into space, a three-dimensional image of the apple that cannot be distinguished from the real and material three-dimensional object. It is important to note that the holographic image is not seen on the film plate itself, but is projected from the film plate into space. And the holographic image you see is real. It is composed of electromagnetic energy and is the byproduct of an electrical and chemical reaction. If you were to compare your photograph and hologram of an apple and cut your photograph in half, you would have half an image of an apple. Cut your hologram in half and you will still see an image of a whole apple. Cut your hologram into a hundred pieces, a thousand fragments and more and shine a reference beam through one of the fragments and you will get an intact image, though slightly more blurred than the original. You can scratch, stain or mutilate the surface of holographic film and still not harm its ability to project a full, three-dimensional image. The image on the hologram is distributed over the entire film plate and is nearly indestructible. When these unique properties of the hologram first became known, brain scientists such as Dr. Carl Prebram saw a strikingly similar parallel between the hologram and the brain. Neurological research has long confirmed that severe brain injuries either destroy in total all of stored memory or none of it, leaving it all intact. For example, if a person has a stroke and half of his brain is destroyed, he doesn't come home and recognize only half of his family. He either remembers all or none of them. There is no relationship between how much tissue is damaged in the brain and how much memory is lost. Research has shown that if 98% of the brain is destroyed, that the remaining 2% of the nerve fibers can retain the whole system's memory function. The brain is amazingly redundant. Neuroscientists then concluded that memory is distributed throughout the brain, 
just as the holographic image is spread over the entire surface of the film plate. Other similarities arose linking the brain and the hologram. For example, the similarity of the brain and hologram for their ability to store tremendous amounts of information. A single holographic plate can receive and record many different images if it is rotated so that a reference beam strikes it at varying angles. One cubic centimeter of a holographic film plate can store over 10 billion bits of visual information. The only known system for storing information more complex and sophisticated than the hologram is the human brain. And the final and most astounding similarity is the ability of both the hologram and the brain to reconstruct from their stored memory three-dimensional images, visual images that are electrochemical representations of reality. Now after years of research and following a great number of studies, scientists have concluded that the hologram is the long sought after model of how information from our life's experience is received, integrated, stored, and visually played back within the brain. Human memory is stored or encoded holographically in electrical and chemical patterns distributed throughout the brain and is recalled or decoded sensorily in sight, sound, taste, smell, and emotion when the proper electrochemical stimuli triggers the memory. If this sounds confusing, let me explain. How many times have memories long stored in your brain and seemingly forgotten suddenly become activated by a smell, taste, sound, or other sensory stimulus? For example, have you ever walked past a bakery and have the delicious smell of freshly baked bread instantly revive memories and sensory impressions that haven't been thought of in decades, perhaps provoking visions of the oven where your mother baked bread when you were a small child. How eagerly you used to spread butter and jam over the warm slices, and how you would savor every bite, allowing your taste buds to fully enjoy the experience. This smell also brought back the emotions of security, warmth, and nostalgia that were associated with your early years at home. Then, as a result of these awakening memories, a whole new set of sensory impressions were projected clearly before your eyes, made easily accessible for total recall. Or you may have experienced the effect of hearing an old song on the radio, a song you haven't heard for years. What kind of memory and emotion suddenly wells up inside of you as a result of this sensory stimulus? Watching an old movie or television show, looking at old photographs, a unique taste or texture felt by the hand, can also serve as sensory reference beams to activate your holographically stored memories. How precisely does the brain act as a holographic processor? As we go about our daily activities, as we simultaneously experience the richness of sight, sound, taste, smell, touch, and emotion that every conscious moment affords, our senses beam literally thousands of impulses to our brain every second. As light and images come in through the eyes, they are translated into nerve impulses, creating waveforms that travel to the brain. As sound waves enter the ear, the auditory nerve translates the waves into electrical signals that also flow to the brain in waveforms. Receptors in our skin pick up the impressions of hard and soft, hot and cold, and transform those impressions into electrical impulses that travel to the brain. Receptors in the taste buds and in the upper nose become activated by a chemical taste or smell and then transfer their impressions via the nervous system to the brain. Our internal reaction to the sum total of these simultaneous sensory events impinging upon our nervous system and the brain we call emotion. Emotion also carries its own waveform. Just as the physical hologram has its object beam and reference beam, the brain and nervous system has its equivalent object and reference beams. Since sight is our richest sense, we perceive about 95% of our object reality through our eyes, the images which come in through our eyes serve as the object beam in our holographic brain. The remaining senses of sound, touch, smell, taste, plus emotion serve as our internal hologram's reference beams. Like the laser in the hologram, these impulses travel through the nervous system from the senses to the brain via nerve pathways, the object beam passing through the eye, the reference beams through the remaining senses. 
every nerve branches, and when the electrical message goes down the branches, a ripple or wave front is formed. When other wave fronts come to the same location from other directions, the wave fronts intersect and set up interference patterns similar in effect to the interference patterns created by the collision of object and reference beams in the hologram. The effect of this meeting is somewhat like the meeting of the ripples that would form in a pond if six pebbles, each one representing each of the five senses plus emotion, were thrown in at the same time. The sum total of all of the interference patterns are distributed and stored throughout the brain, the film plate for our organic hologram. As in the physical hologram, to reconstruct the mental holographic image, a reference beam that was associated with the object beam must become activated. Activating any of the other senses that were associated with the experience you are trying to mentally recreate will trigger the three-dimensional visual image in the mind. So think back for a moment to the bakery we mentioned earlier and recall the smell that triggered the many images in your mind. We now know that a single stimulus, like a scent, can resonate throughout your brain's holographically stored memories and serve as a reference beam that can trigger and reconstruct vivid images of related experiences. One other scientific breakthrough fits into this entire pattern, and it comes to us from the world of quantum physics. Researchers now tell us that if we break down the universe in which we live into its most basic building blocks, reducing concrete objects to atoms, atoms to protons, neutrons, electrons, and then even to more basic particles, we will find that all matter is ultimately composed of electromagnetic waveforms, each possessing a unique frequency and a unique vibration. The concentration of these waveforms are the building blocks for atoms. Atoms are the building blocks for matter and concrete things. Even though we perceive the world as concrete things, it is actually composed of a much more refined and basic system. Even so, our minds come to interpret these waveforms as real, concrete entities. If our senses were tuned to respond and to resonate to a higher frequency of energy, we would probably be able to consciously perceive these waveforms. But since we are sensitive to only the energy found in the colors ranging from red to violet, we see the world through our conscious experience as objects. Of all the electromagnetic energy that surrounds us, we experience on the conscious level less than a billionth of what is going on around us. As in holography, the image you see is not on the film plate, but projected three-dimensionally in space. So it is with the brain. The images we see through visualization are really not in the brain, but are a byproduct of the brain's electrical and chemical reactions, an image that is suspended three-dimensionally in space. Though others cannot see your mental projections, they exist in reality. They are real. They are composed of electromagnetic waveforms that possess energy and matter. In essence, according to the laws of quantum physics, your visual images are matter. The sharper the visualized image, the more it has been imbued with sensory detail and emotion, the greater electrical force it will generate and the more it will mimic concrete reality. Given this understanding, we can begin to conceptualize why visualization is such a powerful force over the mind and body. Whatever vivid images we create of ourselves in our mind, they will be interpreted by our nervous system as real, because in reality, those images are real. If we can truly imagine ourselves as successful, healthy, and happy high achievers, pre-living that life in our mind's eye in rich multi-sensory detail, the images we create will become a nervous system blueprint for success. The images will be received by the nervous system as if they were already a concrete reality. A law in physics, more precisely a principle called the law of electromagnetic energy, tells us one other important truth. Whenever we create an electrical energy field, we simultaneously produce a magnetic field, an attraction force, Thus, there is now a scientific basis for the age-old belief that which we vividly imagine will be attracted to us. This is the law that gives sensory-rich three-dimensional visualization the power to affect reality. Whatever we sense with purpose, power, and emotion, 
we will create a strong electromagnetic field that will begin to attract forces in the outside world to us. By sensing life as productive, happy, and healthy, and by activating the power of the three-dimensional image that specifically details those ideal conditions, you will actually create the opportunities around you to make your vivid hopes, dreams, and aspirations a conscious, concrete reality. On the contrary, by dwelling on your fears, frustrations, and failures, you will attract those things to you that are of similar quality. Literally, our holographic brain and the power of three-dimensional visualization makes each and every one of us self-fulfilling prophets. We become and create that which we choose to visualize. From the beginning of this module, we have come a long way. You have been introduced to many new concepts and ideas. It might be difficult for you to grasp all of this new knowledge and information the first time through. And don't be frustrated if you can't remember everything that was said. The beauty of an audio cassette program is that you can play back the information as many times as is necessary to fully understand and comprehend the information. Your study guide will also assist you in mastering this material. In summary, here are the principles we discussed in this first module. First, you learn that the phenomenon of visualization and its power to influence body, mind, and matter has been a mystery to man since the beginning of time. Second, you learn that through recent discoveries and breakthroughs in brain sciences, physics, and mathematics, that it is now possible to explain and understand how and why visualization occurs in the brain and nervous system, and why it has such tremendous power over our internal and external lives. Third, you learn that the hologram, a three-dimensional image recreated from the interfering patterns of laser light, provides the long sought-after model of how information is received, distributed, stored, and visually recreated in the brain. Fourth, you learn that the visual images we generate are projected from the brain, that every visual image is composed of electromagnetic energy and consists of matter. Vividness and sensory detail increases the energy and power of the visualized image. In essence, what we visualize is real, and our bodies and mind interpret our visual images as reality and react to them accordingly. And finally, you learn that our visual images produce a magnetic field that attracts to us those things that we vividly sense and visualize. This attraction force is what gives us the power to control our lives and our environment for either success or failure. In Module 2, you will discover more fascinating insights into your holographic brain and nervous system. You will learn that it is possible to input sensory-rich, achievement-oriented goals into your holographic brain and have access to their positive effects through prescribed patterns of eye movements. The eye, man's richest sense, is his link to the world and its wealth of imagery. Vision begins with light, the shower of the sun's energy radiating through space to Earth. During each of our waking seconds, the eye sends a billion pieces of fresh information to the brain. The eye is capable of incredible distinctions, differentiating between 10 million gradations of light and 7 million shades of color. That, in essence, is the primary function of the eye, to catch and filter light, channeling it to the brain for interpretation. Thus, while most animals rely upon their senses of smell and sound to connect them to the outside world, Man primarily depends on his eyes. The human eye is an extension of the brain. During the early stages of fetal development, the eye and brain are actually one. Eventually, with the passing of time, the eye grows away from the fetal brain like a plant reaching out, stretching toward the sunlight. The eye becomes an independent entity, separate from the brain, yet inexorably linked to it by a cable of dense nerve fiber, the optic nerve. In the back of the eye lies the retina, a light-catching net where chemistry converts light into electricity. If you were to closely examine the cell tissue of the retina, you would discover that it is woven of brain cells. In a very real sense, then, the human eye, the living crystal of vision, the outpost of the brain, functions as the eye of the brain. Before modern science had come to fully understand the remarkable mechanism of the eye, 
The visual organ attracted the attention of both mystics and poets who were intrigued by its wonder and power. The usually cold scientific observer, Leonardo da Vinci, awed by the marvel of the eye, wrote, O mighty process, what talent can avail to penetrate such a nature as this? What tongue will it be that can unfold such a great wonder? Many cultures have subscribed supernatural powers to the eye. Others have seen it as an evil force, as the evil eye. Gurus and mystics have talked of the imaginary third eye in the center of the forehead upon which they focus their attention to unlock the mysteries of their bodies, minds, and the universe during meditation. Warrior tribesmen in New Zealand believed that the magic of divinity rested within the eye. Whenever a tribal chief died, the members of his tribe ate his eyes in an effort to partake of this divinity. In the words of the poet Robert Blake, the eyes are the dim windows of the soul that betray the secrets of the heart. His eyes gave him away is a phrase much overworked in detective fiction, but it has a strong ring of truth. Customs inspectors, police interrogators, psychiatrists, persons involved in eliciting information from others, know instinctively that the eyes are the mirrors of the mind. The eyes are unconscious betrayers of our emotions. They can signal to the perceptive observer the way we think and feel. Modern science now confirms the long-held belief that the eye actually does more than fill the mind with light and vision. We have learned through research, for example, that as well as being the organ for vision, the eye has non-visual functions as well. Everyone is familiar with the story about the student who, when he is asked a question by his teacher, looks upward, whereupon the teacher advises him, you're not going to find the answer on the ceiling. Undoubtedly he won't, but we are now aware that his instinctive eye movement allowed him to retrieve the particular information he needed from the memory stored within his brain. Breakthrough research tells us that the eye acts as a mechanism to stimulate the recall of sensorily stored impressions in the brain. Certain patterns of eye movements have been found to beam electrical impulses to the brain. These impulses then act as reference beams that stimulate and unfold our holographically stored memory. You have probably been aware of this phenomenon of eye movement and memory recall all of your life, but have never given it conscious thought. For example, have you ever noticed that when you ask someone a question whose answer requires some searching of memory stored long ago, that the individual's eyes shift to various positions as he attempts to draw the information to consciousness from long-term memory? Or have you ever observed the eyes of one who is caught up in a lucid daydream a fantasy so rich in sensory detail that the person loses momentary consciousness of reality. Did you notice that their eyes were in a centrally fixed position? Have you ever witnessed the darting rapid-fire eye movements of one who was asleep and dreaming? You may have noticed momentary spasms in the eyes of one who intentionally fabricates an untruth. Or perhaps you have been aware of your own subtle eye movements as you have searched the recesses of your memory in an attempt to reconstruct memories of the past or to project your thoughts into the future. In a study conducted at the Langley Porter Neuropsychiatric Institute at the University of California School of Medicine in San Francisco, the researchers asked volunteers a variety of questions. On a quarter, which way does the profile of George Washington face? Describe in vivid detail the appearance of your first grade teacher. What is the definition of the word economics? Recall in your mind the voice of your first grade teacher. Depending on the type of information that was demanded, that is, whether the request was for verbal concepts, visual images, or auditory memories, the eyes of the research subjects shifted in predictable positions as though the movement aided the accessibility of the memory and data recall. A similar study at Yale University asked subjects questions like, what color was your first bike? How many rooms were there in the house in which you grew up? How many letters are there in anthropology? If you won a million dollars in a lottery, how would you spend the money? Once again, specific patterns of predictable eye shifts were noted by the researchers. Numerous other studies conducted by university researchers have confirmed and validated the relationship between specific patterns of eye movement 
and sensory memory recall. Since the eyes act as a trigger for the recall of sensory impressions stored in the brain's memory, then by intentionally moving the eyes in a particular direction, it is possible to strengthen and fortify your ability to instantly recall or trigger the holographically encoded impressions in your mind. Until now, brain researchers have always considered our lack of control over the information stored in our brain as the weak link in the system. Without a method of control, it has been like having a huge library of good and bad holographically encoded film plates haphazardly stored, with no system of indexing or labeling that enables you to select the quality information you'd like to play back. But now we have that missing link. With the simple, easy-to-learn patterns of eye movements explained in this cassette, you'll be able to unlock a new doorway into your mind. You'll be able to create doorknobs or mental laser beams to store, activate, and recall the memory of high-achievement behaviors and habits stored in your mind. Consider again just how important this scientific knowledge can be to your future success in all aspects of your life. By manipulating an eye movement in a certain direction, you can input or recall specific sensory impressions into and from your brain. These mental laser beams will provide easy access to your mental storehouse, increasing the capacity and ability of your brain to create, store, and activate your personal sensory-rich images of achievement. Before we introduce you in detail to the specific patterns of eye movement and what they mean, let's first go through an exercise that will acquaint you with your own instinctive patterns of eye shifts. As I ask you, one by one, the following questions, which will require you to search your memory, take a few moments to search your mind for each answer. While you do this, allow yourself to be sensitive to where your eyes want to naturally shift. Do they move to the right or left, to an upper or lower position? Even if the shifts are fleeting or very subtle, try to gain a sense of the direction and inclination of the movements that occur. First, I'll ask a question. After each question, I'll pause for a few moments to let you search out the answers in your mind. To allow you more time to think, we recommend that you stop the recorder after each question, then start it again when you are ready to proceed to the next question. Are you ready? Let's begin. The first set of questions has to do with visual memory recall. Think of someone from your past whom you haven't thought of in years, maybe a childhood friend or a grade school teacher. As clearly and as vividly as possible, visually recall from memory the exact contour of his or her face, head, shoulders, and body. Next, recall the exact posture, length of step, and style of this person's walk. And finally, recall the characteristic facial expressions, smile, frown, and laugh of this person. The second set of questions deal with the mental construction of visual images. Construct in your mind the following images as clearly and as vividly as possible. A mental picture of a red-winged chimpanzee with a giraffe's neck and an elephant's trunk. Pretend you're a baseball with eyes. What do you see as you are thrown toward a batter? What do you see traveling through the air as you fly out of the ballpark? Now imagine that you have won a million dollar jackpot. Construct in your mind's eye in exact detail three luxury items you will purchase with the money and see yourself possessing those items. The third set of questions deals with auditory memory. Recall from your experience the following sounds as clearly as possible. The subdued clapping of hands in token applause. The sound of your grandmother's voice calling your name. And finally, the sound of the voice of your first childhood best friend. The fourth set of questions concerns construction of new sounds. Create a language of your own and mentally sound out the translation of the words talk and smell. 
Next, hear the voice of Johnny Carson introducing you as a guest on The Tonight Show, telling the audience about one of your worthy accomplishments. The fifth set of questions deals with recalling the memory of emotions and feelings. Think of the following emotions you have experienced in your early childhood and mentally recreate them as clearly as possible. The feeling of fear. The feeling of sudden joy. And the feeling of supreme accomplishment. The sixth set of questions concerns motion memory and body sensation recall. Try to capture the sensations you would experience in your arms, legs, hands, feet, etc. as you mentally perform each of the following actions. The feeling of running your feet through cold, wet sand. The feeling of your hand in motion drawing a square on a paper. The sensation of straining leg muscles, heavy breathing, and fatigue as you run up a steep hill. The seventh set of sensory impressions deals with the sense of smell. Try to recreate from memory the following smells. The penetrating vapors of Vicks VapoRub. The smell of rotting fish. And finally, the aroma of freshly baked bread. The last set of impressions concern taste. Try to sense, based on your past memory, the following tastes in your mouth. The taste of an artichoke. The taste of salty, buttery popcorn. The taste generated from biting into a mouthful of green sour grapes. How did you do on this exercise? Was it hard to answer all of the questions and recreate all of the sensory impressions? Were you conscious of your eyes shifting as you sifted through the sensory detail required by each question? Now let's take a few minutes to explore in depth these patterns of eye shift movements and connect them to the specific senses with which they're associated. These movements are pictured in your study guide, so follow along in the guide as we discuss each eye shift with its accompanying sense. The first eye shift pattern relates to visual memory recall. When you draw deeply from visual memory, recalling, for example, the fine details of your childhood schoolroom, the face of an old friend, or a good golf instructor demonstrating the placement of the feet when hitting short irons, your eyes will naturally shift to your upper left. The harder it is for you to recall the visual memory, the higher to the left your eyes will go. It's important to note if you're a dominant left-handed person, your eyes will probably go to the upper left as you do a mental search of visual memory. If you are left-handed or ambidextrous, you might deviate from the eye movement patterns explained here. Don't worry, when you are in doubt, Retest yourself by going back to the questions asked above and chart the tendencies of your eyes to gravitate toward various positions as you process each sensory question. The second eye shift pattern relates to the construction of visual images. When you are creating new visual input, piecing images together that are not yet reality, such as constructing in visual detail the elements of a desired goal state, your eyes will shift to an upper right position. And again, the harder it is to visually construct an image, the higher your eyes will go to an upper right-hand position. Just the opposite will be the case for some left-handers, upper left for visual construction. The third pattern of eye movement we will discuss here is the eye shift that activates auditory memory. This is your storehouse of remembered sounds. Your eye shift movement, if you're right-handed, is lateral left. Again, some left-handers might be reversed and access auditory memory with a lateral right eye shift. For the construction of sounds, the fourth eye shift pattern is lateral right. This eye movement pattern, a fine tool for composers and writers, comes into play when you are creating and blending sounds and words. For example, in visualizing the ideal scenario for career success, if you can imagine a co-worker saying, Wow, you really did get that $100,000 order. 
your eye shift for this and other constructed sounds is lateral right. For some left-handers, lateral left. The remaining eye shift codes should be the same for both right and left-handers. The fifth eye shift movement is for the recall of emotional sensations and feelings. When you recall emotions and feelings from the past, your eyes may first shift to a lower left-hand position to signal the brain for the memory search. Then to activate the memory hologram, you might recall a visual memory, upper left, to see the person or event involved, followed by a move to the lower left to focus into the emotion. Again, you have used a reference sense to activate another sense to recreate the whole experience. To recall the memory of body motion and sensation, you would activate the sixth eye shift pattern. Your eyes would shift to the lower right. The seventh eye shift position is for smell. When you recall the stored memory of a smell, your eyes move to an approximate 10 degree upper central shift, the position your eyes would be in if they were searching your nasal cavity to pick up the scent of a particular smell. To recall the sense of taste from memory, you would activate the eighth eye shift position, which is a lower 10 degree central position, the position to which your eyes would naturally gravitate if you tried to search with your eyes for a particular flavor or taste in your mouth or taste buds. The ninth and last eye shift position we will deal with in this program is that which we call the sensory synthesis position. This eye movement is the blending and synthesis of all of your senses. This eye shift position, which is the central focus position, allows you to mentally replay a sensory rich three-dimensional holographic image. This position is the ultimate in sensory processing. When any memory is in sharp focus, or you can easily recall it without any conscious effort, or when you are daydreaming, for example, your eyes will be in this centrally focused position. In this position, all of your senses, sound, sight, touch, taste, smell, and emotion, converge to one central point to blossom forth into a rich image. While all of these eye shifts are distinct movements in the direction indicated, they are fleeting, almost imperceptible movements. In most persons, they are discernible to the careful observer. Later in this program, we will show you how to utilize these eye shift patterns to draw from and input sensory-rich high achiever behaviors, attitudes, and habits into your holographic brain. You will learn to use these eye movements to program vivid, three-dimensional success goals into your nervous system. What is the link between eye movement and memory recall? How and why do certain patterns of eye movements trigger and activate holographically stored memory? Scientists have discovered a basic and ancient mechanism in the depths of the brain that allows us to understand this most intriguing relationship between eye movement and memory activation. Called the reticular formation, the root reti, taken from the Greek meaning net or web. This ancient mechanism is a bundle of tangled, densely packed clusters of nerve cells located in the central core of the brain stem. To clearly pinpoint its location, refer to your study guide for this section. Roughly the size of a little finger, the reticular formation runs from the top of the spinal cord into the middle of the brain. This area contains nearly 140 billion nerve cells, nearly 70% of the brain's estimated 200 billion nerve cells. This electrical powerhouse not only is the spark of the mind, but is the gatekeeper of consciousness. The brain depends on impulses from the reticular formation for keeping us awake and alert. When electrical stimulation from the reticular formation lessens, we sleep. Injury to the reticular formation results in loss of consciousness and coma. The primary function of the reticular formation, and the one which concerns us here the most, is to act as a sensory filter to the brain, deciding which messages are significant enough to be sent to the conscious mind for attention. Every second, 100 million impulses assault the mind, carrying information from the body senses. A few dozen of these messages are permitted to enter the brain stem. Of these, the conscious mind heeds only a few. While you may be partially aware of many sights, sounds, smells, and body feelings, your attention is limited to only one sensation at a time. 
This narrow channel of attention we call concentration. Without this powerful sensory filter, your brain would not be able to sort the significant messages from the unnecessary and trivial. Your reticular formation, this catalytic bundle of nerves, continually sifts, selects, and forwards only essential life-enhancing information to the brain. Without the reticular formation, our brain's electrical system would be overloaded. We would constantly be aware of all of the 100 million sensory impulses that invade our nervous system every second. Imagine for a moment sitting at your desk at work, trying your best to finish a report that must be mailed by the end of the day. Well, it's up to your reticular formation to filter out all the stimuli around you that could distract you from the job at hand. It must protect you from the sound of phones ringing nearby, a typewriter pounding away in a neighboring office, voices in conversation down the hall, the scent of coffee brewing nearby, and the roar of a jet plane as it flies overhead gently vibrating the building. This same web of nerves must also shield you from extraneous thoughts, concerns over how your daughter is faring with her battle over the flu, excitement over a vacation in Hawaii the following week, and the dull pain of a tension headache that has been bothering you most of the day. Fortunately, if there were an important external message that did need your immediate attention, the reticular formation would instantly channel it to the appropriate area of your brain to capture your attention. If the fire alarm in your office suddenly started ringing, or if someone were calling for help from the street below, this would quickly be brought to your conscious attention. The reticular formation is finely tuned to spot those stimuli that merit your immediate concern and alert your brain. As you may have guessed, the reason we have taken the time to explain the workings of the reticular formation is that it is intricately involved in the relationship between sensory memory recall and eye movement. The nerves which control eye movement, the oculomotor nerves, originate and derive from the reticular formation. It is thought that whenever your eyes move to a particular position, either instinctively or intentionally, your reticular formation is activated, however subtly. With each eye movement, the oculomotor nerve stimulates the reticular formation. This stimulation opens up a particular sensory channel through which the reticular formation sends or beams an impulse to the brain to stimulate sensory memory recall. When the eyes shift in particular directions, to the upper left, for example, or to the lower right, the reticular formation is prompted to access certain types of information from the brain, whether it be visual, tactile, auditory, cognitive, and so on. These patterns of eye movements literally open up sensory channels to the brain, clearing noise, interference, and distraction from our sensory processor, allowing a laser-like beam of light to zero in to trigger and activate sensory memory. The best way to demonstrate the actual clearing of these sensory channels and the principle of laser-like memory activation through movements of the eye is to show you how difficult it is to recall sensory information with your eyes in conflicting sensory positions. For example, with your eyes closed, subtly shift them to the lower right position. This opens up a channel for the memory and sensation of touch and creates an internal climate of sensitivity to internal body functions. While in this position, try to reconstruct from stored auditory memory the chirping sounds of crickets on a warm summer's night. With your eyes in this position, do you feel any internal resistance? Is it difficult to bring up the clear sound of the summer crickets? Do your eyes want to pull to the lateral left position if you're right-handed or to the lateral right if you're left-handed? Now with your eyes still closed, move them to the lateral left position. Do you feel the auditory channels clear? Is it now easy to tune into the sound of singing crickets? Now move your eyes to the lower left position and try to solve the following math problem in your mind while in this position. What is the solution to 198 divided by 6 times 4? 198 divided by 6 times 4. Don't worry now about the correct answer. Again, did you feel the internal resistance? Did your eyes want to move up? 
Now, still keeping your eyes closed, move them to the upper right-hand position if you're right-handed or the upper left if you're a pure left-hander. Is it easier to concentrate on finding the solution to 198 divided by 6 times 4 with your eyes in this position? These are vivid examples demonstrating the relationship between eye movement and clear access to information stored in the brain. Oh, by the way, if you still haven't solved the math problem, the answer is 132. Another intriguing fact emerges relating to the direction of eye shifts. Why, for example, does an upper left movement, or a right-hander, trigger visually stored memory? Why does a right-handed individual shift to the right to construct visual information, as in the act of thinking or mathematic calculation? The answer lies in the dual nature of brain structure. Research has shown, and we will discuss this at greater length later in the program, that just as we have two eyes, two ears, two arms, and two legs, we also have two brains. The brain is divided into two distinct sections, the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. The left hemisphere, in right-handed people, is specialized for verbal and analytical functions, such as reasoning, calculation, thinking and analysis, and the construction of non-related items. The right side of the brain is responsible for processing visual, emotional, sound, and intuitive information. We also know that the right side of the brain controls left body movement, and the left side of the brain controls right body movement. So when you shift your eyes to the left, left eye movement being directed by the right side of the brain, you are drawing upon the power of the right side of the brain, evoking the memory of sight, sound, and emotion. When your eyes shift to the right, you are activating the power of the left side of the brain, triggering the mental laser beams that allow you to reason, analyze, and construct. Also, the eyes seem to move in the direction to where our main sensory receptors are located. They move up to trigger vision. They move to the side on a plane level with the ears to activate sound. The eyes seem to search the upper nasal cavity to capture smell and then move centrally down toward the mouth to activate the taste buds. Our new knowledge about eye shift movements raises many intriguing questions that brain scientists will be exploring in the upcoming years. Do you remember that in the beginning of this discussion on the eyes that we talked about the phenomenon of rapid eye movement in dreaming, the centrally focused gaze of a daydreamer, and the spastic eyes of a liar? Now we have the knowledge to understand the relationship between these states, holographic memory, and eye movements. During the sleep dream state, our eyes dart quickly back and forth under closed lids. Until now, this so-called rapid eye movement or REM sleep has been a mystery to sleep researchers. Now we can confidently speculate that rapid eye shifts occur during dreaming because their rapid movements are stimulating the reticular formation which in turn sends rapid laser-like impulses to the brain to randomly ignite mental holograms or dream images. Because our dreams are so compressed in time, that is a one-minute dream may seem like several hours, the eye movements must be rapid to compress all of the dream content that is needed. During conscious daydreams, we are often caught up in vivid three-dimensional images which are oftentimes difficult to distinguish from reality. During these daydreams, all of our senses are fused into one rich experience. This sensory blending is associated with a central focus position in which our mental holograms are at their sharpest point of definition rich and alive in sensory detail. The next time you look in the eyes of one who is daydreaming, you'll know why their eyes are caught up in a centrally focused gaze. And finally, when a person tells a lie, why do their eyes oftentimes go into momentary spasm? Because as an untruth is spoken, there exists in the brain no holographically stored memory to back up the words. As the eyes try to search for a corresponding sensory experience that the words convey, there is no stored reference point in the brain from which to draw. The eye's reaction in not being able to locate stored memory is a spasm. The reticular formation searching for stored memory comes up empty and signals back down to the oculomotor nerve. The oculomotor nerve sends an impulse to the muscles which control eye movement and the muscles contract and send the eyes into a temporary spasm. 
one who is a pathological or neurological liar does not know the difference between what is true and what is unreal. The pathological liar has lied so many times and in such exquisite sensory detail that his brain accepts those fabricated images as real. His brain has a rich storehouse of fabricated holograms. When such a person bears an untruth, his eyes don't spasm because there are corresponding holograms in the brain which confirm the pathological liar's words. Though this information about the eye, eye movements, the brain, and sensory recall provides interesting conversation, there is a practical application for this information which you will learn to use in this program. With these prescribed patterns of eye movements, you will be able to input, store, and recall three-dimensional sensory-enriched high-achiever behaviors, attitudes, and habits into and out of your holographic brain with a literal blink of an eye. Before we move on to the next cassette, completely familiarize yourself with the nine eye movement positions and their corresponding sensory reference points. Exercises in your study guide will help you to master this new information. And when you practice your eye movements in an attempt to consciously stimulate sensory memory, your eyes should be closed. The eye movements themselves should be subtle, not extreme, in order to avoid eye strain and tension headaches. In fact, many people find that excellent results can be achieved by just imagining the eye movements, rather than consciously moving their eyes. In this mere act of imagination, your eyes will move to the desired position imperceptibly, but just enough to attain the desired benefits and results. In the next cassette, you will be introduced to a model of a high achiever. This model represents a composite of the most dominant behaviors, attitudes, and habits possessed by real-life high achievers. This information is taken from dozens of studies conducted by the nation's top research centers. Once you become acquainted with these characteristics, we are going to show you a step-by-step -step discipline which will allow you to permanently incorporate these high achiever characteristics into your brain and nervous system. Utilizing the latest scientific breakthroughs in the brain sciences, you'll be able to create a sensory-rich, three-dimensional, detailed image of achievement that will become your lifelong blueprint for success. In 1921, an obscure writer by the name of Harry Leon Wilson wrote a lengthy novel entitled Bunker Bean. It tells us an intriguing story about a man who was tricked into believing in himself. Since birth, Bunker Bean was led to believe that he was unworthwhile, inferior to everyone and everything. As he grew into adulthood, he lived a life full of fear and timidity, until one day a false spiritualistic medium convinced Bunker Bean that he was the reincarnation of Napoleon Bonaparte. He was shocked to learn that he was once master of the world and that people were once afraid of him. The medium told him that he actually possessed all of the qualities of the great Napoleon and that the time was ripe for those qualities to come to fruition. The thought of who he was inspired Bunker Bean. He went to the library and voraciously read every book he could find about Napoleon, his former self. He collected pictures of Napoleon and hung them everywhere around his small attic room where he could feast his mind on them. He imitated the speech, thoughts, and actions of his former self. In his own mind, he actually was Napoleon. Wilson goes on to tell of Bunker Bean's quick climb to the top of power, wealth, and fame as a result of his new frame of mind. But one day, the great Bunker Bean discovered the spiritual medium was a fake. He really wasn't Napoleon after all. He had been cheated only for his money. Bunker Bean was crushed. But in the years he had assumed the role of Napoleon, he had formed the habits that go with success. Habits are hard to break. He couldn't change. It was now natural for Bunker Bean to do the things great men did. Wilson concludes that the greatest discovery Bunker Bean made was that every man was born a king. Every man was born to riches. To believe is all that matters. The Soviet Union, in the education of their youth, utilizes a technique similar to the principle learned by Bunker Bean. Early in life, Russian youth are tested to determine their physical, psychological, physiological, and intellectual characteristics. These characteristics are then analyzed and profiled into a document called a psychogram. A child's psychogram is entered into a computer. The computer then matches the psychogram to a Soviet model of achievement. 
a Soviet citizen who has achieved distinction and preeminence for his or her skills, abilities, and accomplishments. Once matched for similar characteristics, the child is sent away to a Soviet training center where its body and mind is fine-tuned to assimilate the characteristics of the model. After intensive study about the model's lifestyle, thinking patterns, creative style, and attitudes, the children are led to believe that they are actually the model. They are instructed to think and feel the way the model would think and feel under all circumstances. After a short period of time, the young children demonstrate great abilities in the discipline that was chosen for them, whether it be athletics, art, music, or science. The system is so effective that most of the children in their prime surpass the performance of their models and often become models for other Soviet youth to follow. The story of Bunker Bean and the account of the Russian system of youth education illustrates an important principle which we will be concerned with in this cassette. This principle, simply stated, is that we become like those whom we choose to imitate or model. If we have the opportunity to emulate models of success, we will acquire the attitudes, values, beliefs, and habits of those models and will probably be successful. If we consciously choose to model our lives after those who fail, or if we have only been exposed to failure-prone models, we will probably live lives of great disappointment and dissatisfaction, lives that reflect the characteristic attitudes and beliefs of the models we use for our life's blueprint. Modeling is a phenomenon common to all cultures of the world. Everything from language, mores, attitudes, behaviors, familiar customs to religious practices is gradually learned through observing real-life models. In this cassette, you will be presented with a model of high achievement. Through research conducted at Harvard, Yale, Stanford, and the University of California, we have identified a pattern of attitudes and habits associated with high achievers. We have narrowed down these unique characteristics to 21 distinct behaviors and habits, which we have assigned to five categories, mental, emotional, physical, financial, and spiritual. The characteristics of a high achiever, which will be presented here, are drawn from a composite profile of high achievers in many different fields and lines of work, including business executives, managers, supervisors, entrepreneurs, small business operators, salespersons, educators, athletes, engineers, and professionals such as doctors and lawyers. The criteria we used to define a high achiever was an individual who achieves his own goals while enriching his own life as well as the lives of others, including his family, co-workers, and subordinates. Once you become thoroughly familiar with the characteristics of this model, you will be able to pattern yourself after the model and create your own personalized images of achievement in your mind. You will be able to envision with sensory-rich clarity perfect and rich images of success. These images will take to seed in your brain and nervous system until they gradually take root and eventually blossom into achievement-oriented behavior. And your high achievement behavior will bring forth a rich harvest of personal success in anything and everything you decide to undertake. As we work through the model and discuss the various characteristics associated with a high achiever and the underachiever, you will notice that in some instances you will identify with the high achiever and in some cases with the underachiever. Because you may have a few characteristics in common with the underachiever doesn't mean that you are an underachiever. It just is holding you back from experiencing an ultimate level of personal success. Extinguishing those self-defeating behaviors and acquiring the attitudes, behaviors, and habits of a high achiever is what this program is all about. Now, let's examine our model of the high achiever and see what it is that distinguishes the high achiever from the average underachieving person. In the beginning, let's look at the mental aspects of our model. Under the mental habits of the high achiever, we will discuss four characteristics common to all high achievers. The first is sensory goal vision. An unusual trait among high achievers is that they know precisely what they want out of life and they can sense it multidimensionally before they achieve it. They can not only see it, but also touch it, taste, and smell it, and imagine the sounds and emotions associated with it. 
The high achiever pre-lives every goal and every desire before he accomplishes or realizes it. And this sharp sensory goal vision becomes a powerful driving force in the lives of high achievers. It is the fire that incites the emotions and drives the man minute by minute, hour by hour, and day by day to realize the goal. Sensory goal vision is the life force behind motivation. The more clearly the high achiever can sense the goal and its consequences if it's achieved, the more obsessed and committed he becomes to pay the price of long, hard work that is required to achieve it. Michelangelo, the great Renaissance artist, sculptor, engineer, and military strategist, attributed his genius to his ability to first envision what he wanted to create and thus create the work precisely as he had sensed it. He captured the essence of what we mean by sensory goal vision when he so eloquently stated, what I desire, I must first sense. What I sense, I create. In sculpture, for example, Michelangelo would first envision in raw stone a well-defined three-dimensional image of the work of art he had in mind. When he later went to work with hammer and chisel, he had total recall of that earlier vision and used it as an internal model for the work he was performing. It is poignant to point out that as one walks down the hallway of the museum in Florence that houses Michelangelo's greatest sculpture, the David, one sees blocks of stone with unfinished sculptured arms and legs, each started with great expectation, but rejected by the eye of Michelangelo as being imperfect. To the critical eye of an expert, there seems to be no flaw. To Michelangelo, they did not conform to his original vision. Michelangelo had a vivid three-dimensional sensory goal vision of what he wanted to create. He could sense and feel the finished product in his mind with perfect clarity. This clarity instilled and fueled the drive and emotional desire that allowed him to sustain a disciplined, persistent effort toward his vision. Through the precise application of his skills, which were also developed and refined through hard work and discipline, he was able to carve the marble to conform to the exact details of his vision. And at the end of this hallway of imperfection, majestically stands the David, with every muscle, every vein, and every exquisite contour, a monument to the genius of Michelangelo, and a testament to the potential of what the mind of man can achieve when it is inspired with multidimensional, goal-oriented, sensory-rich vision. The underachiever, the average person on the other hand, probably doesn't have a main goal or a life's purpose, nor does he have preliminary goals, the specific things one must accomplish to reach the main purpose. Average people don't know where they want to go because thinking about it is too much work. And if the underachiever did have a goal, it would probably be vague, a string of general undefined words that represent empty shells of thought. For example, they would attempt to describe them like this. I want to be rich. I want a big house. I want to be happy, healthy, and fulfilled. Ask them to describe what they want in specific detail. What does it look like? How does it sound, taste, and smell? What does it feel like? With questions like these, you will draw an empty stare because the underachiever cannot describe what it is he wants and what he must do to specifically get it. The only limitation of the underachiever is his inability to make the effort to vividly sense what he wants. If he would do this, the electrochemistry of his brain would be put into action, creating the internal drive and desire that would propel him to his desired destination. The high achiever realizes a goal as sort of a deja vu experience. Once he realizes the specific goal, it is as if it had already been accomplished before because he had pre-lived the achievement in exquisite sensory detail. Henry David Thoreau once said, if one advances confidently in the direction of his dreams and endeavors to live the life he has imagined, he will meet with success unexpected in common hours. High achievers possess the desire to create, to make something concrete from nothing. They move toward their dream, their vision, like sleek, slender, stalking lions. Moved to action by a driving hunger, they can see, smell, taste, and feel the exact detail of the realized goal. The second mental habit that was common among all high achievers is that which we call the law of the harvest, disciplined mental application or just plain hard work. This is the habit of will, the iron will to go after your vision with super intensity 
to sustain a period of long, hard work without receiving immediate results. With faith, you see your vision coming closer to realization with each hour, day, month, and year's effort. Disciplined mental application is the realization that anything worthwhile is going to require hard, hard work. It involves the pursuit of absolute excellence, a feeling of great personal pride in what you're doing. It means going the extra mile and then some. The highways of life are crowded, jammed with those who just put in an average effort, no more, no less. For the high achiever, there isn't any traffic in the extra mile zone. Not that many people travel that part of the road, it seems. Consider the young person who has a vision of being a great doctor. Consider the years of education, college, medical school, internship, specialization, and finally, maybe after 15 years of post-high school work, he or she reaches the first goal, becomes an MD, and is now ready for the decades of practice or research which greatness will require. Or consider the farmer who in early spring daily prepares the soil for seed, plants his seeds, weeds, fertilizes, thins, waters, nourishes the growth, and finally, after months of toil, reaps a rich harvest. The farmer didn't expect to plant the seeds in hard soil and then return in a few days and reap a rich harvest. From experience, he knows that if he follows the laws of nature, the harvest will be plentiful, assuming nature cooperates with favorable weather conditions. This assumption requires faith and flexibility on the part of the farmer and on your part as you prepare for your personal life's harvest. What we've learned from our research with high achievers is that they are dedicated and they do extra hard mental work. It's habit with them now, so if you want it bad enough, you'll be willing to pay the price. You'll endure the struggle. You'll swim upstream against the current of mediocrity. Even though you may not realize immediate benefits, you'll persevere because you know that nothing worthwhile comes cheap. The law of harvest complements vision. It is the lifeblood of vision. It is vision in action. It separates the high achiever from those who tried and gave up. It is the excellence that Michelangelo and every other truly great human being from Socrates to Einstein have given us as a model to follow. The underachiever looks for the easy way out, the instant fix, the magic jack and the beanstalk seeds that will sprout overnight into a giant vine, leading to a hoard of treasure in the sky. The underachiever doesn't want to pay the price of sustained effort. He gives up when the work seems to get hard. If he can't see immediate results today, he will quit tomorrow. The underachiever lacks persistence and mental drive. He doesn't want to go the extra mile. And when he is forced to do something, he procrastinates, puts it off until the last possible minute, cramming, rushing, and creating a product of inferior quality. The underachiever sees only the end product and doesn't realize the hard mental work and the physical effort the price someone else has had to pay to produce the product. He or she wants the end result without paying the price, and in pursuing it, takes the shortcuts, the easy ways, and always ends up with something inferior. After a while, inferiority becomes a habit, a way of life. The underachiever always settles for second best. The high achiever does it now, never puts off until tomorrow what has to be done today. The third mental characteristic of the high achiever is his habitual, unending search for knowledge. A famous lawyer once said, when I'm congratulated in the courtroom after an impressive victory, and I hear the word luck attached to the compliment, I'm inclined to recall that the lucky part occurred at two o'clock in the morning as I pored over law books, bone-weary and red-eyed, preparing this case. Luck never seems to visit me at the movies, on a golf course, or on a cruise somewhere. My search for knowledge, information, and answers to problems is largely mental. High achievers are not workaholics, but are flexible in their application of the values that drive them toward excellence. High achievers maintain a continual search for knowledge. They are curious by nature. They want to discover how and why things work. They search out the mysteries of human nature to discover the things that motivate men. They may occasionally pick up some light reading, say at an airport, but generally are serious readers, especially of biographies. They find in biographies positive models from which to draw blueprints for their own success. They follow what the great semanticist Alfred Korzybski termed the principle of time-binding. 
the ability of the human race to record its experiences and pass them on to future generations. Simply stated, this amounts to being able to use the time-tested knowledge of humankind and apply it to today's situations with positive energy. It is often called the wisdom of the ages. No one likes to be called average or an underachiever, but there are so many people in our society who are. They dissipate the wonderful learning power of their minds in passive experience, with television, for example. For hours a day, they submerge the anxieties and frustrations of their unproductive lives in the imaginary lives of television characters. They fall victim to programming aimed at the lowest common denominator of unintelligence, and so waste their marvelous talent-laden mental capacity. The underachiever also has the trite habit of knowing everything. The underachiever is resistant to new ideas, new methods, and new inventions because change threatens his weak foundation of knowledge. The underachiever is quick to prejudge others according to this meager base of knowledge without exploring all the facts firsthand before making an appropriate decision. An underachiever lives in this funny world of black and white and misses the subtleties and nuances of the world as it is. He lives by labels and categories. An illustration that highlights this point is the man who declared that all Indians walk in single file. Challenged to justify his logic, he quipped, well, at least the one I saw was walking in single file. Underachievers hardly ever entertain the notion of it appears to me to be this or that. Generally, they adopt and confirm whatever their first wild guess may be without benefit of any real thought or investigation. For the underachiever, a little bit of knowledge is dangerous because it makes him think he has all the knowledge necessary to make competent decisions. Underachievers expect people, institutions, and events to conform to their half-truths, and by doing so, they cut off any hope of learning new ways and ideas. They put themselves into a prison of solitary confinement, bound by their own self-imposed limits. Rousseau described their plight when he wrote, Man is free, yet everywhere he is in chains. Some of these chains come from within, secured there by ourselves, while others are wrapped around us by others without our ever noticing. In essence, the underachiever, in the words of Thoreau, lives a life of quiet desperation, existing, not living, mentally dead while still alive. Perhaps the great achiever Albert Einstein best typified the idea of this habitual search for knowledge when he so brilliantly said, the more I learn, the more I realize I don't know, and the more I realize I don't know, the more I want to learn. High achievers draw supreme pleasure out of creating something where once nothing existed. He thrives on solving problems and creatively turning problems into opportunities and opportunities into achievements. This ability we call creativity and is the fourth and final mental habit cultivated and developed by all high achievers. Most high achievers follow a predictable pattern in conceiving, developing, refining, and bringing to reality their ideas. First, the high achiever is motivated to create by perceiving a need or a problem. In this stage of the creative process, he gathers information, raw materials, and resources that seem applicable to the problem at hand. Secondly, the high achiever consciously releases the problem, rests, relaxes, or turns his or her attention in another direction. During this stage of incubation, the gathered images and thoughts in his mind shift and realign themselves. Then, during the third stage, through a surge of sudden inspiration, the answer or solution to the problem spontaneously occurs. This sudden illumination is accompanied by feelings of certainty and joy. It is the moment of discovery. During the last stage of this creative process, the high achiever goes to work to implement or apply the solution, making it a concrete reality. Underachievers do not value creativity. Their comfort zone lies in the act of imitation. They feel at home with following the crowd and seeing only the mundane in the beautifully sublime. To the high achiever, the act of creation is his or her lifeblood. It is the culmination and offspring of sensory-rich goal vision seasoned with hard mental work and knowledge. The second main category of high achiever characteristics or habits we will discuss is that of emotion, emotional control and stability. The first area of emotional control we will discuss is the high achiever's habit of confronting and conquering fear, 
wherever and whenever the fear stimulus is present. This doesn't mean that you should dive into Niagara Falls simply because you have a fear of drowning, especially if you can't swim. That's suicidal. High achievers face their subtle fears, their everyday doubts, and the self-imposed limitations we all have to get rid of. One high achiever interviewed for a post-study follow-up told of how he learned to conquer his fears. When I was 15, he recalled, I had a fear of flying. I was terrified to go on an airplane. I decided my fear was a weakness I could not tolerate, so I set out to conquer it with a strength. I worked and saved my money to afford flying lessons, and after a few months I passed my flight training and was awarded a private pilot's license by the FAA. In the process of training, I learned the laws of aerodynamics, why an airplane stays up, and gained a respect for the intensive training and qualification of pilots. In challenging my fear, I gained new skills, new emotional strength, greater self-confidence in my own abilities, and a sense of greater self-worth. It seems that a crisis or serious problem always enables the high achiever to discover the tremendous power within himself. It seems that every problem is an opportunity for growth and self-mastery. Every fear is an opportunity to conquer. Madame Marie Curie once said, nothing in life is to be feared. It is only to be understood. And yet many people find themselves in fear of poverty, criticism, rejection, ill health, pain, loss of love, old age, loss of freedom, and of death itself. The high achiever may not actually welcome any of these fears, but will do battle with each and every one. Picture yourself swimming upstream with a 20-pound weight hanging around your neck. Not a pleasant picture, is it? Being bound by their fears, average people put weights of one kind or another around their necks every day when they fail to face up to these emotions. The high achiever, though, does not accept such unnecessary burdens. The high achiever habitually understands that every adversity, every unpleasant experience, every failure, every physical and emotional pain carries with it the seed of an opportunity for gain and growth. The high achiever looks for that seed whenever he experiences that which would appear to the average person as adversity and germinates it into a harvest of personal strength and growth. The high achiever, whenever confronted with the feeling of fear, tackles the fear head-on before it can lodge and take root in his nervous system. The high achiever may appear to the ordinary person to take unnecessary risks, but the truth is that high achievers are very conservative in games of chance, but very daring in games that require skill. To them, whenever they have the opportunity to confidently apply their skills in a situation that may appear risky, the high achiever views such a situation as an opportunity. The second emotional characteristic common among high achievers is the habit of inner directedness. The inner directed high achiever is motivated by the burning desire to achieve, to excel, to expand, and to improve. The inner directed high achiever takes responsibility for his or her actions. When the inner directed high achiever is angry, he doesn't say, you made me mad, or you hurt my feelings, or you don't love me. The inner directed individual perceives and processes the emotional reactions by thinking and feeling, I allowed myself to get angry, to get hurt, or to feel unwanted. He or she then sets out to change the conditions that cause those emotional reactions. The inner directed person doesn't blame failure on others or on conditions. He or she takes the full responsibility for mistakes, analyzing what went wrong and what went right, and then sets out on a path of refinement and self-correction, learning from the experience. The outer-directed person blames others for his misfortune, is dependent on others for approval, acceptance, and love before he will approve, accept, and love himself. His mood is set by the way he thinks people will perceive him. He reacts, for example, to himself in the mirror, thinking, today I look terrible. No one will think I'm attractive. I'll be rejected. I'll have a terrible day. His mood is dependent on an outside source or a make-believe facade. In contrast, by being interdirected, taking charge of the pathway he follows, the high achiever rides in control the crest of life's wave instead of being helplessly washed ashore by it. One of the most rewarding emotional habits the high achievers referred to in the studies was their ability to build warm and lasting relationships. The high achiever views people as having intrinsic worth, goodness, the high achiever learns more about himself by taking the time to listen to others. 
the high achiever possesses a sense of human responsibility for and an ability to respond to the needs of others who are close to him. And the high achiever has both the capacity and the desire to establish intimate relationships with his spouse, children, and family. Relationships built upon love, respect, and mutual understanding. If one has achieved all of his material goals, but has, due to neglect, lost the closeness and love of his family and children, he was not considered to be a high achiever in the studies. The achiever was found to establish and maintain a healthy balance between material goals and close, tender family relationships. The high achiever values the art of listening, listening with both mind and heart. By listening, the high achiever expresses respect for the worth he senses in others. The underachiever is always fighting personal and personality battles. Underachievers view people and relationships as being disposable. They are always trying to get even with those who hurt them. Underachievers always have to get in the last word, are always formulating what they want to say next while pretending to listen to others. We learned that another key emotional habit possessed by high achievers is a habit we call time competency. This means taking strength from the past, learning from mistakes and gaining confidence from achievements. It means planning for the future, establishing clear sensory goals with action plans for their accomplishment. And most importantly, it means living in the present. Out of every hour, according to psychological studies, most people tend to spend 58 minutes either in forgetting about the past or in fearing the future, and only two minutes thinking about the present. Not so with high achievers. They treat each minute as an unrepeatable miracle. They put quality, energy, and vitality into each hour. They live, not merely exist. The high achiever awakens in the morning with a desire and purpose and views the day as a challenge, a new opportunity, a fresh start. To the high achiever, the morning is the time to put the finishing touches on the day's plan. The high achiever develops time-competent philosophies, such as, if I wake up an hour earlier than I normally do, I can add six more 40-hour weeks to each year. By being time-competent, the high achiever builds a necklace of successful years. A successful year is a combination of successful months, weeks, days, and hours spent in achieving their goals. And goals achieved are a collection of successful actions. That's not the way underachievers look at it. They don't have any goals, long or short term. They run out of time. Underachievers spend their time by living in the past, dwelling on their failures, their emotional hurts, and regrets for decisions they made or failed to make. Or underachievers spend this time somewhere off in the future, fearful of events to come. Underachievers always preface their goals, if they have any, with, Someday I will. Someday I will be rich. Someday I will be successful. Someday I will change. High achievers were found to view their hopes, aspirations, and goals in the present with today I am. Today I am rich. Today I am successful. Today I am going to change. The fifth emotional habit commonly possessed by high achievers is their ability to receive and take to heart constructive criticism without getting angry, feeling rejected, or put down. The high achiever realizes he is not perfect and accepts such constructive feedback as an opportunity to maximize his personal growth and development. The high achiever takes the constructive side of critical feedback, measures it against his strengths and weaknesses, and then initiates a plan of action to improve the criticized attitudes, behaviors, and skills. The underachiever views constructive criticism as threatening, the underachiever usually responds to such feedback in anger, in hurt, or in denial. The underachiever then vows to get even with the source of the critical feedback or withdraws into a cowering shell of reticence. The high achiever, on the other hand, possesses a real dynamic sense of control, the power to change him or herself, and uses constructive criticism as a tool for continual personal and professional refinement. The last emotional characteristic we gleaned from the studies on achievers is that of power. The high achiever is a leader, not because he seeks leadership, but because it's freely given, a tribute to his personal self-mastery. High achievers possess the qualities others would like to possess, and thus, by example, they both show and lead the way. The goal of the underachiever is to make people think more of him, Underachievers harbor resentment at someone else's achievement.
They glorify their own corporate gains and brag about themselves and their petty victories. The goal of the high achiever, the leader with real power, is to make other people think more of themselves. High achievers view their accomplishments as natural consequences of hard work and discipline, and high achievers empathize with the price others have had to pay to realize their achievements. This calm assuredness and respect for others is the magnetic force that draws people to the high achiever. It is the source of his power. So these are the mental and emotional habits common to all high achievers. Mentally, the high achiever possesses the habit of envisioning in vivid sensory detail their long and short-term goals. They know and respect the value of hard mental work. They possess an almost unquenchable thirst for knowledge. And they have learned instinctively, or by trial and error, to tap their mind's full creative potential. Emotionally, high achievers challenge and master their fears. They are driven by an inner force to achieve and take responsibility for their actions and the consequences of their actions. They are time competent. They balance the past and present with the future. They also have the emotional capacity to accept and apply constructive criticism to their personal and career development. And finally, because of their self-mastery and their ability to make others think more of themselves, high achievers possess a sense of real power, the power to inspire, to lead, and to harness the creative energy of others. This leads us to the third category of physical characteristics and habits which were discovered in the studies to be universal among high achievers. The physical characteristics we will discuss here enables the achieving individual to develop and maintain a high level of energy, physical stamina that allows the body and mind to endure long periods of hard, disciplined, mental, emotional, and physical work. From our research, we have identified five critical physical habits that high achievers have identified as being essential to their success. The first habit could have been listed under the mental or emotional category, but because it ultimately affects the body, we have chosen to include it under the physical. It is the ability to control physical stress. High achievers have the ability to sense when their bodies are in a state of stress and can eliminate that stress from their system. The high achievers cited in the studies had developed ways to dissipate daily tension that, if left unattended, could develop into long-term, life-threatening stress. Most of the high achievers reported that they scheduled time out of their daily activities to calm their minds and bodies. Incorporating techniques such as listening to soothing music, mild meditation, or controlled breathing exercises, supercharged achievers are able to dissipate the wear and tear effects of tension. Some have even mastered techniques that allow them to mentally control and direct the flow of oxygen-rich blood to tensed muscle and nerve tissue anywhere in their bodies. Such a method you will learn later in this program. Underachievers are under a constant state of stress and hypertension. Their muscles are rigid and their heart rates are fast. Their tense muscles constrict oxygen and nutrient-rich blood flow to their brain, vital body organs and nervous tissue. In order to transport blood through these constricted passageways, their heart must pump harder to exert more pressure. This extra pressure, sustained over a period of time, weakens artery and vessel walls. A slight amount of pressure at the wrong time will rupture a weakened vessel. This results in a stroke or heart attack. The underachiever, in order to cope with this inner stress, uses mind-dulling tranquilizers and drugs. The high achiever, sensitive to stress and its potential debilitating effects, has learned to diffuse it through conscious effort and control. The second physical characteristic of the high achiever is his ability to resist illness and disease. The word disease means one who is not at ease or one who is tensed and stressed. Tension and stress is brought on by fear and anxiety. Any subtle fear or anxiety will cause muscles to contract and blood vessels to constrict. Physical disease or illness sets in when blood cannot be transported freely to the body's organs and nervous tissue to provide oxygen, nutrients, and antibodies, and to carry away and dispose of toxic waste materials. The high achiever seems to have a built-in resistance to communicable illnesses like colds and flu. When he feels the onset of a cold or flu, he mentally dismisses the illness from his system with the attitude that he doesn't have the time to be burdened with such a problem. Such a mental framework seems to activate the body's disease-fighting antibodies to eliminate most physical disorders associated with sickness. 
and when, on rare occasion, antibiotics are necessary, the high achiever can speedily release the illness from his system within a few days. On the other hand, the underachiever seems to catch a major cold or flu bug every year and loses 10 to 15 days of work as a result. With each change of season and whenever the weather changes, the underachiever is a prime target for colds, sore throats, and numerous other strange viral and bacterial infections. Underachievers dwell on, think, and talk about poor health. They harbor in their minds constant fears of major health catastrophes, such as cancer and heart attack. The high achievers' thoughts and images are health and vitality oriented. Though they are not immune to major disease and illness, statistics prove they live long and healthy lives. Contributing to the high achievers' stress-free and disease-resistant body is his habit of eating nutritious food. The high achievers surveyed in the studies indicated that they eat to live and do not live to eat. They enjoy vitamin-enriched vegetables, greens and fruits, lean meats, poultry and fish. They avoid salt, artificial additives and chemicals, processed sugars. They do sometimes pacify, in moderation, an occasional sweet tooth. You know a high achiever when you see one. He or she has skin that radiates with health, and their eyes shine with light and energy. You can also identify underachievers by their looks. They seem to be tired, foggy-eyed, and sluggish. The underachiever eats with abandon anything that teases the palate. Underachievers tend to be addicted to salts, sugars, and high caloric foods. They don't know when to stop eating. As a result, they develop bodies that on the outside reflect carelessness and neglect. On the inside, they possess a poor body image. Many times, the underachiever feels he is beyond hope and is incapable of being loved. As a result, this loneliness seeks nourishment and succor, usually in the form of more food. A Hindu proverb states, even nectar is poison if taken to excess. High achievers seem to adhere to this philosophy as a way of life. They respect their bodies and know that alcohol and other harmful substances taken in excess will dull their sensory clarity and rob them of their precious energy. Complementing sound nutrition, resistance to illness, and the control of the effects of stress is physical exercise. The high achievers interviewed in the studies all indicated that they participate in a consistent discipline of aerobic exercise. They like the challenge of jogging, cycling, the rigors of racquetball, soccer, and tennis, the invigoration of cross-country or downhill skiing, the challenge of golf, or the simple pleasure of walking. The high achiever knows that oxygen is their life source and the energy substance of vitality. The underachiever, in contrast, is physically stagnant, with neither the desire, energy, discipline, or time organization necessary to sustain a plan of physical exercise. Most underachievers experience their exercise vicariously in front of a television set, watching others partake of the benefits of physical activity. The high achiever physically pushes himself the extra mile. He knows the joy of exhaustion, the victory of spirit when the body and mind surpass old limitations and expand to meet new physical challenges. The last physical habit associated with a high achiever that we need to discuss here is the habit of energy rejuvenation, or simply stated, adequate rest or sleep. The research we investigated indicates that most high achievers need only six to seven hours of sleep a night. This period of rest allows the body and mind adequate time to revitalize itself, building and renewing body tissue and recharging the electrochemical capacity of the brain. Any more or less sleep, reported the achievers, seem to dull their senses, reduce their mental clarity, and stress their bodies. Conversely, the underachievers reported that they found it difficult to go to sleep at night and nearly impossible to drag themselves out of bed in the morning. Many underachievers suffer from insomnia, disturbing recurrent dreams and nightmares. The underachiever, when awake, seems sluggish and dull after having spent the night tossing and turning, unable to turn off the myriad of voices, noises, and rapid-fire mental dialogues that seem to keep the wheels of his mind spinning well into the wee hours of the morning. The high achievers indicated that after a night of peaceful, restful sleep, they woke refreshed and energized every morning, looking forward to the new opportunity to experience the beauty of life in its fullest sense. Now it's time for us to discuss the material or financial habits that high achievers have cultivated and developed. The first characteristic we will discuss is what we call the habit of dollar sense. 
a concept that quite accurately describes one of the prime reasons why high achievers enjoy such a high level of material success. The concept focuses on the fact that we can either spend our money on capital goods, such as real property, stocks, machinery, metals, and other growth-oriented goods, or we can spend our dollars on consumer goods, such as automobiles, stereos, cameras, television, items that depreciate over a short period of time and lose value. In the short term, the more we spend on capital goods, the less we can afford to spend on consumer items. And the more we spend on consumer items, the less we can spend on capital goods. By investing in capital generating items, we limit our current consumption of luxury consumer goods, sacrificing those luxuries for a future profit. High achievers invest in capital generating goods today, sacrificing the valueless consumer items because they know that this choice in investment will generate enough of a return tomorrow that they will be in a position to buy all of the luxury items they will ever desire or need. Conversely, underachievers invest their dollars foolishly in luxury items and soon come to realize, many times too late, that their investments are worthless monuments to their lives of indulgence and self-gratification. More sadly, they discover that after they have acquired a taste for the good life, there is little money left to sustain that lifestyle. The high achiever builds his financial foundation on the solid rock of capital-generating investments, sacrificing the monetary pleasures and luxuries that such money could buy until a later date. The second financial characteristic of the high achiever is the habit of financial control. High achievers budget their financial resources knowing exactly where each dollar goes and what it will return. The high achiever realizes the fallacy of the get-rich-quick scheme. He resists those so-called opportunities because he knows from history and experience that only the dedication to excellence, a commitment to quality, and lots of mental, even physical effort will bring the lasting riches of life. Any shortcuts and backdoor visits will not add to a lasting foundation of financial security, independence, and a lasting feeling of achievement. When you look at the other end of the spectrum and see the underachiever, you are likely to see a person who believes in the philosophy of get rich quick. He sees the fruits of others' efforts and wants to take a bite without paying the price of time and work. The high achiever follows the well-seasoned advice of Benjamin Franklin. There are two ways to solve your money problems, he says. Augment your means, make more money, or diminish your wants. Either will do, but the best plan of all is to do both at the same time. The third financial habit common to high achievers is the habit of career security. The high achiever understands the nature of the free enterprise system and utilizes this principle to create a solid and growing career base. If the high achiever is an employee, he knows that his employer views him primarily as a capital investment. To stay employed, he realizes that he must generate a return to his employer that is more than what his employer is paying him, at least $10 for every $1 he receives in pay. The high achiever, once he has demonstrated the ability to produce, is given more responsibility, earning greater pay with the opportunity to produce even a greater amount of profit for his employer. If the high achiever is an employer, he fairly rewards his productive employees in proportion to their contribution to the organization's profitability. In contrast, the underachiever thinks the world owes him a living. He thinks just because he graces the workplace with his presence, his employer should pay him handsomely. The underachiever is always looking for a new job, continually circulating resumes that contain nothing more than a glorified attendance record of where he has put in his time before, a puffery of subjective skills he thinks he possesses. Yet ask him what those skills have generated in dollars and cents for his past employers, and he can't answer. He has never considered that angle before. The underachiever will always be the last to know and the first to go when the economy slides. The high achiever will always be in demand, no matter what the economic conditions, because he will always be able to quantify in dollars and cents his distinct contributions to profitability. The last financial characteristic that the studies found to be in common among all high achievers is their understanding and application of the law of compensation. Simply stated, whenever one gives of their substance, they will be compensated in kind many-fold for their efforts. 
This principle can best be demonstrated if we look at an example from nature. If you were to plant one tomato seed, it would germinate into a plant that would bear a minimum of 10 tomatoes. Let's say each of these tomatoes is filled with 100 seeds. If you didn't eat the tomatoes and were to save the seeds, you would have a total of 1,000 seeds from the original one seed. Come next planting season, if you planted all 1,000 seeds and all of these seeds produced plants with a minimum of 10 tomatoes, with each tomato containing a minimum of 100 seeds, you would have at the end of your second harvest a total of 1 million seeds. If that's hard to believe, stop and calculate it mathematically. A million to one return in two years. High achievers realize the power in this natural law and apply it liberally by donating a portion of their financial increase unhesitatingly and without compulsion to causes they deem to be worthwhile. Underachievers do not take advantage of this law of financial cause and effect, even though it could powerfully work for them. Conversely, whatever the underachiever does not share or impart, he loses in two ways. One, he loses the increase he could have obtained by imparting a part of his substance, and two, the law works in reverse, shutting out opportunity altogether. The underachiever swims against the stream of natural law. Unfortunately, the current is swifter than the underachiever, and he gets washed away, at least financially. The high achiever understands this basic law of compensation and reaps many times over its abundant benefits. The last category we concern ourselves with in this program concerns the basic spiritual habits most high achievers have developed. This is not an area where simple, straightforward habit patterns are the rule. It is an area of personal mystery and wonder, different for each living human being. By spiritual, we mean the fusion, the synthesis, bringing into focus the elements of body, mind, emotion, and material characteristics that gives one direction and purpose, and the energy and internal driving force to fulfill that purpose. This habit of spiritual fusion or focus can be compared to sunlight on a cold winter's day. The sun's heat potential and fiery energy can hardly penetrate the freezing cold, even on the brightest, the sunniest of winter days. But take a magnifying glass, hold it over a piece of paper, focusing the massive energy of the sun, and you create a flame, a fire, capable of consuming everything it touches. The focus made the difference. The high achiever continually brings into focus, reviews and refines his habits of body, mind, and emotion. The resulting focus can be called spirit. It can be called mind with a capital M. It can even be identified by the psychological term superego. Whatever we name it, it is the focus which helps us most in reflecting and reviewing our performance in the areas we have discussed, reflecting on what we might be against where and what we are now and looking for discrepancies between the two. These discrepancies become needs, areas to be mastered, controlled, and changed. Underachievers do not value in-depth reflection. They only do it when they are forced into it through a major life crisis, such as a death, illness, or financial ruin. The high achiever has developed and refined this habit of focusing, reflection, introspection, and behavioral refinement. The second and final spiritual characteristic possessed by every high achiever who has ever lived is what we refer to as a sense of higher self. Concerning this sense of higher self, one 19th century American theologian, Parley P. Pratt, wrote, An intelligent being in the image of God possesses every organ, attribute, sense, sympathy, affection that is possessed by God himself. But these are possessed by man in a rudimental state, in the subordinate sense of the word. Or in other words, these attributes are in embryo and are to be gradually developed. They resemble a bud, a germ, which gradually develops into bloom and then by progress produces fruit after its own kind. And so it is with high achievers. They possess a perspective, a vision of higher self, a sense of purpose that transcends time and space. They instinctively feel that they are potential gods in embryo. With this dignified sense of self-worth blended with a balance of purpose, human respect, and hard work, the high achiever brings into being that which seems impossible for the common man or woman. Now that we have outlined the characteristics, behaviors, and specifically the habits of the high achiever, and sharply contrasted the differences 
separating the high achiever from the underachiever, let's proceed to do an in-depth assessment and see how you measure up against this model. Emerson said, the unexamined life is not worth living. You will begin that examination on the next cassette. Now that you've become acquainted with the characteristics, attitudes, and habits of a high achiever, let's discuss for a moment how you will incorporate and utilize this information during your quest for high achievement. The high achiever model we provided listed positive habits and desirable strengths. We also described some self-defeating behaviors and habits common to underachievers. During the presentation of the high achiever model, as the characteristics were presented, you may have identified with many high achiever qualities and some underachiever characteristics as well. Now, we recommend that you go back and replay the cassette of the high achiever model a second time, but this time with a prescribed purpose. Your purpose will be to methodically identify and analyze your personal strengths and weaknesses and to determine whether or not they enhance or interfere with your progress toward high achievement. In order to more effectively do this, you will use the high achiever model as a standard for contrast and comparison. Your first exposure to the high achiever model probably left you with some subjective reactions, feelings, and thoughts about where you stand in comparison to the model. The second playing of the cassette will add objectivity and precision to your comparative thinking because you will be provided with a tool for self-assessment, a formulated plan that will guide you through the process of self-discovery. Again, the purpose of this cassette is to give you the necessary tools to help you discriminate the differences or discrepancies which separate your current habit patterns from those of the high achiever model. Using the assessment tool which we have developed, you will compare, measure, and rank your behaviors against the high achiever in each category of mental, emotional, physical, financial, and spiritual habits. This process of behavioral extraction and distillation is analogous to the making of fine wine. Just as the vintner selects and processes the grapes, presses them, and filters out extraneous matter and opacities, so you must extract, identify, condense, and make clear those self-defeating behaviors that are holding you back from high levels of achievement. Similar to the way one looks at a tree and infers from its rings those periods of drought, freezes, and fertilization which have influenced the growth of the tree, with the knowledge you gain in this cassette, you will learn how to objectively look at yourself and discover how your patterns of habit have influenced your personal growth and achievement. Now turn to the section in your study guide entitled, How Do You Measure Up? A Formula for Self-Assessment, and locate the form titled, Personal Assessment Form. I'll pause here a moment while you locate the form. As you see, this form lists 21 habits of the high achiever. Each habit is graded on a scale of 1 through 5. As you listen to each habit being discussed on the last cassette, contrast where you currently are compared to the ideal expressed by the model, using the rating scale as your tool for measurement. On the scale, 1 means never, 2, seldom, 3, sometimes, 4, often, and 5, always. Let's create, for example, the first habit listed under the mental category, sensory goal vision. The assessment form in the workbook reads, sensory goal vision, the habit of translating every goal into specific, well-defined images, rich in vision, sound, touch, taste, smell, and emotion. Pre-living the realization of the goal and its positive consequences in rich sensory detail. As you think of your current goals, rank yourself either 1. I never set sensory detailed goals. 2. I seldom set sensory detailed goals. 3. I sometimes set sensory detailed goals. 4. I often set sensory detailed goals. Or 5. I always set sensory detailed goals. Once you rank your behavior in one area, then proceed to the next habit description and follow the same procedure for the remaining 20 high achiever habits. You will utilize this assessment in the next cassette as you learn to prioritize or determine your greatest developmental needs and set high achiever behavior goals. 
As you complete this exercise, be as realistic and as honest as you can while you compare yourself to the high achiever model. Don't be too hard on yourself, nor should you try to appear better than you are now. Be a cold, impartial judge of your behaviors and habits. This objectivity will benefit you later when we move to the goal-setting portion of the program. In this exercise, you will come face to face with identifying the self-defeating behaviors that are keeping you from achieving the kind of success you have always hoped for. To objectively look at one's weaknesses and to challenge them takes honesty and courage. Concerning this, Robert Louis Stevenson wrote, You cannot run away from a weakness. You must sometimes fight it or perish. If it be so, why not now where you stand? With the information you derive from this exercise and from the rest of the Neuropsychology of Achievement program, you will begin to fight. You will learn how to discipline yourself for battle and to turn your self-defeating habits into productive, achieving behaviors. Some people, upon realizing their weaknesses, think that they are beyond the hope of change. They think their weaknesses are fixed, a part of their personality that is almost immutable. He or she feels that they cannot change, and as a result, should not be responsible for the consequences of their actions. Such a person rationalizes his failures by thinking, this is the way I am, I'm never going to change. This type of attitude toward self-change and responsibility is nicely illustrated in a story about a scorpion who asked a frog to give him a ride across a stream. No way, said the frog. If I do, you'll sting me. Of course I won't, assured the scorpion. If I do, you will sink and we'll both die. So the frog agreed and began to ferry the scorpion across the water. In the middle of the stream, the scorpion suddenly injected a fatal sting into the frog. With his last breath, the frog asked, Why did you do it, you fool? The scorpion replied, I couldn't help it. It's my nature. People are not scorpions, and we have learned that self-defeating attitudes, behaviors, and habits are not fixed or unchangeable. We all possess the internal power to change if we place enough value on the potential positive benefits that such a change will bring into our lives. Once you have identified your strengths and weaknesses, we will introduce you to a course of action that will allow you to fortify your strengths and to overcome, conquer, and master your self-defeating behaviors, negative habits that serve as stumbling blocks on your life's pathway to success. You will learn how to reverse those self-defeating habits and turn them into high-achiever behaviors. If you really desire to achieve all of your life's goals, whatever they may be, you must first acquire the habits, characteristics, and attitudes of a high achiever. Many people do not realize this. They feel that they are entitled to success in spite of themselves. That is not true. Speaking of this cause and effect relationship that exists between positive self-development and achievement, Milton Sills, a late 19th century dramatist and actor, wrote, One of life's greatest paradoxes is that almost everyone wants to improve his circumstances but hardly anyone wants to improve himself. These two are inseparable. The only thing that holds people back from achieving the things in life which they deem valuable and worthwhile are bad habits. Play the High Achiever model cassette as often as is required to make an accurate and honest assessment of your high achievement developmental needs. As you play through the High Achiever model cassette and perform this assessment exercise, keep in mind the following advice given to us by a man named David O. McKay. What progress can there be for a man unconscious of his faults? Such a man has lost the fundamental element of growth, which is the realization that there is something bigger, better, and more desirable than the condition in which he now finds himself. In the soil of self-satisfaction, true growth has poor nourishment. Now you should begin the self-assessment exercise. Now that you have completed your self-assessment, compared and rated your current attitudes, behaviors, and habits against that of the high achiever model, you are now ready to learn how to translate your self-development needs into sensory-rich goals. Sensory goal setting is a primary motivational tool that will allow you to permanently acquire and realize the goals you desire to achieve. 
Many expensive programs are available which provide methods for goal setting, how to determine, analyze, set, and realize your goals. Most of these programs teach you how to write detailed goal statements. They promise success if you will only read your goal statements every day and if you can sustain enough motivation to work toward their achievement. These programs are for the most part ineffectual. They lead you to believe that by just writing and reading your goals that some strange power in your subconscious mind will translate those words into reality. Words and verbal goal statements alone will not build the necessary internal driving forces that allow you to sustain a hard, long-term work effort toward the realization of your goals. These type of programs figuratively promise to give you a step-by-step -step recipe on how to bake a nicely raised loaf of bread. Every time you follow the recipe, though, your dough doesn't rise. You think, after a while, that it is your fault when the bread doesn't rise. After a while, you conclude that you're just not cut out to make bread, so you give up. What you didn't know, though, was that the recipe was missing one critical ingredient, the yeast. Without the yeast, it could not chemically react with the dough to make it rise. If you would have known about the yeast, your bread making would have probably been successful and you would have perceived yourself as a competent bread maker. And your success would have probably motivated you to try to tackle more challenging baking projects. Merely writing and reading flat mechanical goals and giving yourself one-dimensional positive affirmations is like trying to bake without yeast. Such a recipe will not build the necessary internal driving forces that allow you to rise above the norm and to experience lasting personal success. The greater you can sense, in rich detail, the things you really desire, the more motivated you will become to sustain the hard work and disciplined effort that will get you there. The more your goals are fired with sensory detail and emotion, the easier it is for your nervous system to successfully bring about their fulfillment. Unless your goals are translated into detailed, sensory-rich images, they will, like the bread baked without yeast, lack the power to chemically ferment in your brain and nervous system, the power necessary to raise you to higher levels than you now are. The instructions contained on this cassette will introduce you to a step-by-step -step system that will allow you to translate your desired high-achiever habits into concrete, sensory-inspired goals. Your neuropsychology of achievement goals will be different from anything you've done in the past. First, they'll possess the qualities of a solid goal. That is, they'll describe the precise outcome you want by being result-oriented, measurable, and time-specific. But more importantly, and this is the key, they'll also be sensory. And they'll explain the consequences. Sensory-rich statements detailing the benefits you will derive if the goal is accomplished. We're going to ask you to set your high achiever goals with the same intensity that Michelangelo employed to create his masterpieces. You will be able to possess the same sensory power by mastering the following four-step process for goal achievement. First, review your self-assessment form. Select the high achiever behaviors you would like to possess and then write your goal statements on three by five cards being sure that each statement includes these components of a well-formulated goal. First, they must be results-oriented. Second, measurable. And third, time-specific. Your study guide will explain in greater detail each of the three requirements of an effective goal. Second, add a vivid sensory description of each goal on the 3 by 5 cards. A description of how it looks, sounds, smells, tastes, and feels. Third, on the reverse side of the card, spell out the consequences of achieving the goal in as much sensory detail as you possibly can. This exercise will help you clarify your motives and drives for goal attainment and will provide you with the motivation for accomplishing your goal. And fourth, sort out the cards. You will have selected at least one and probably more goals in each of the five high achiever model categories. Rank them until you come up with a top priority. You'll want the first goal to be the one that stands out above the rest. This will allow you to focus on the most important issue in your life and to acquire that behavior as you work toward its high achievement.
To make sure you're not left upstream without the proverbial paddle, let's illustrate several goal statements to serve as models for you to follow. Incidentally, the goal examples we're going to talk about come from real people in real-life situations. Please remember you are setting goals for yourself, goals that are important to you. To make this program successful, you must dig deep down inside yourself to write your goals and to describe the sensory indicators that will enhance your personal performance. The idea of adding sensory descriptions may be new to you and may be difficult to do at first, but work at it. It's going to get easier and it will pay off. It's different, but it works. It will help make you stand out from the crowd of underachievers and enable you to perform in superior fashion and be rewarded for your exemplary performance. That's what you want, and that's what this program is designed to help you do. The first example is from the mental category. The situation leading up to the goal statement involved a fellow we'll call Michael, who had serious problems studying and becoming competent in mathematics. He really gave up on the subject in high school because he lacked the patience to stay with a subject that required a long, sustained effort. As you know, math is one subject few of us learn overnight. Michael's lack of patience kept him from entering his chosen profession, medicine, a fact that caused tremendous despair until he took the bull by the horns. A few years ago, he became familiar with the law of the harvest. As ye sow, so shall ye reap. He got a second chance, so to speak. In an attempt to qualify for medical school, Michael enrolled in night classes at a local university to study college algebra. He had a good teacher who worked well with adults, and this, plus his newfound willingness to be patient, proved to be an unbeatable combination. Here's where Michael started. He set a goal to learn algebra by the end of the semester and to be able to use it error-free in test situations. Does this meet the test of being results-oriented, measurable, and time-specific? Yes, it does. The result was that he will learn algebra. The measure was that he would apply it error-free. And the time frame was the end of the semester. More importantly, Michael used the sensory descriptions to spur on his effort of goal attainment. Here's how he wrote them. Vision. I see myself mastering complex formulas, working late into the evening, and then applying my new skills in chemistry, physics, and biology, seeing myself as a master over the sciences, a master physician. Sound. I hear the scratching of the pencil as I do precision work and the praise from the instructor for my progress. Touch. I feel the body fatigue that wants to slow me down, but I push on. I feel my tired hand, cramped from working and reworking problems until I get them right. Smell. I smell the aroma of the classroom that becomes the battleground for my victory over the lack of discipline I had in my younger days. Taste. I taste the flavor of salt that comes from the sweat I put into my untiring effort. Emotions. I experience the burst of excitement in my chest after unraveling especially complicated formulas, a feeling likened to the clicking in place of internal gears as I wind my way forward to an A in the course and the feeling of conquest, of now nothing is impossible. Michael then outlined the consequences of achieving the goal. It would allow me to pursue higher courses of study in the sciences, the courses I need to qualify for medical school. By mastering this course, I will be able to set the stage for becoming a doctor. Michael thus imagined himself as a doctor, utilizing all of the richness of vision, sight, sound, touch, taste, smell, and emotion. Now in his mid-thirties, Michael is presently on his way to becoming a doctor, enrolled in one of our nation's top medical schools. The next example in the emotional category focused upon the dilemma of confronting fears. Most fears tend to immobilize our actions, and the high achiever wants to be confrontive and to mobilize all the resources he or she has at hand. This fear, explained by an associate we'll call Sarah, had to do with rejection. It seems almost everyone has this fear to some degree, but in Sarah's case, it was stifling her opportunities for fun and growth. She was avoiding social interaction because of the fear of rejection. She retreated rather than risk the effort. If she could learn to overcome this fear, it would open up new vistas and a whole new world of opportunity. But she rarely went to parties, to professional meetings and other social places, 
and when she did, she experienced severe tension and stress. She was allowing emotional uneasiness to control her better judgment. That all changed, however, when she sat down and wrote a plan, which read, I will control my emotions so I can attend 85% of the parties, meetings, and other social events that I will be invited to during the course of the coming year. Further, she added the sensory descriptions, which sounded like this. Vision. I see myself well-dressed, standing with good posture, every hair in place, as I relate to prominent people who are thoroughly enjoying my company. Sound. The sounds are vivid, too. I hear the laughter of people pleased with my humor and the praise I receive for my intelligence and charm. Touch. I revel at the touch of people's handshakes and the warmth expressed by their grip. Smell. I smell the fragrance of my perfume as I prepare myself for the evening and the aroma of a bustling meeting room filled with energized people. Taste. I taste the peppermint mouthwash I use in preparing myself to go and the textures of the food being served at the banquets. Emotion. I feel strong and assured as I freely mingle in the group, meeting new people and learning new things about myself in the process. I feel a new sense of strength, a power that will dissolve all future fear. For the consequences of meeting the goal, Sarah wrote, when I overcome this fear, I know I will be able to do anything and everything. It will break down the self-imposed barrier to my success professionally and my overall happiness. I feel that everything I ever hope to accomplish is locked up in this fear. Sarah then pre-lived in her imagination the realization of the consequences and called into action all of her senses and emotions. Did Sarah's goal statement meet the test? The result was to control her fear and she did. The measure was more than met by accepting nearly every invitation that year for social and professional growth, and the time frame of one year was a realistic one. The sensory descriptions and consequences, she said later, were the keys to being able to work through the fear of rejection. The next example meets the needs of a great number of people. It has to do with weight control and diet. A few years ago, a business associate named Charles slipped into a donut habit that resulted in 30 extra pounds he didn't really need. His friends and family were kind, which didn't make it any better for him. They said things like, Oh, have you gained weight? Or you look good, you chubby rascal, you. Charles finally got the picture, though, and set a goal to lose those dreadful 30 pounds within two months. This goal passed the results, measurement, and time tests. Then he added the sensory descriptions. Vision. The vision he had was taken from a five-year-old photograph of himself at his ideal weight of 165 pounds, taken at his wedding, trim, lean, and strong. Also, he saw himself walking into the clothing store and picking out a neat pair of slacks that were three belt sizes smaller than he currently wore, 36 to 32. Sound. The sounds he heard were people from work, play, and home telling him how good he looked and how youthful he was appearing. Touch. The touch or feel was his hand running smoothly down his chest to his flat, hard stomach. He felt lighter, supple, agile, and could run effortlessly with an energy level he had not experienced since his youth. Smell. The smells were associated with fresh vegetables, fresh fruits, and the clean aroma of the farmer's market, where he would now shop instead of stopping at the donut shop after work. Taste. The taste was mouth-watering bites into those fresh fruits and vegetables that would comprise most of his diet for two months. Emotion. The emotional feeling was the power he felt by being able to drive past the donut shop to the market and sense the pounds melting away as he continued to improve his physical appearance. The consequences Charles chose for himself, if he met the goal, were, I could look at myself in the mirror and feel the vigor of youth having a sense of pride, a feeling of leanness, and a high level of energy. I would be more attractive to my wife and present a better image at work. I could wear the clothes I want to wear instead of baggy clown suits. My health would improve, alleviating a 30-pound load from my heart. Charles then sensed, in exquisite sensory detail, the coming to life, the blossoming into reality, the consequences of his goal. The end result was a loss of 30 pounds in two months 
and a 32-inch waist. And Charles has been able to maintain his ideal weight. He even enjoys a donut or two now and then. The next example deals with the return on investment that we can give to ourselves or to our employers if we work for someone else. It falls under the category of career security. Most underachievers fall into the trap of thinking the world owes them a living. They'll get by with contributing the minimum to stay on with the organization. The person I will tell you about, who will call Susan, overcame this self-defeating habit by setting this goal. I will return to my employer 20 times the amount paid to me this year through innovation and quality, extra effort and attention to detail. I will measure, that is quantify, and keep records of my financial contribution to the company. This objective meets the triple test for goal setting, as you can see, and Susan's sensory descriptions went like this. Vision. I saw my boss presenting me with a merit pay increase of $7,000, along with a bonus of $5,000 for my profit contributions. Sound. The sounds I heard were congratulations from people in the office as they shared in my success, a success that resulted from hard work and diligence. Touch. The touch I felt was the boss's arm around my shoulder and the feeling of the new crisp cash I received when I cashed my bonus check. The body sensations I felt were a mixture of exhaustion after a long night of work and the invigorating chill of morning as I woke up early ready to challenge a new day. Smell. The smell I associated with this goal was the boss's office, which has a pine scent along with luxurious leather, symbols of power and authority. Taste. The taste I had was of the succulent dinner that my husband and I enjoyed, steak and lobster at one of the finest restaurants in town, as we celebrated my accomplishment. Emotion. The emotional ecstasy of achieving the goal that seemed so far down the road, and the feeling of security that overcame me when I realized that I would be a tremendous asset to any profit-centered company. Susan's consequences for achieving the goal were, I would prove to myself and have the evidence to give my employer that I can contribute value and give a high return for my employer's investment in me. I would receive raises in pay and benefits and increased responsibility. I would also have the well-documented leverage to market myself to another company if I desire, receiving a higher salary and more responsibility. I would also have a steady job under all economic conditions. Needless to say, Susan has risen in her organization and now commands respect, salary, and confidence commensurate with her contribution. And that's quite an achievement for a high school dropout. Susan later went back and earned not only her high school diploma, but an undergraduate degree in liberal arts, and is now working on a master's in business administration. She also knows she contributes measurably to the place she works in. It gives her a sense of ownership and accomplishment to be innovative. Will Susan survive in an economic crunch? Of course she will. She'll be more sought after than ever because she's learned how to contribute to profit. Everybody wants a winner in hard economic times. Our last example has to do with self-reflection and comes under spiritual habits. This may seem strange as a goal description, but let us tell you about it. The man who told us about this experience, we'll call William, had been suffering from an inability to get things together in his life. He could not seem to focus or synthesize all the good things he had going for himself like a good education, good family background, and good family ties, a good job, good prospects for the future, and being well thought of at work, in the community, and by friends. But something seemed to be missing. William was searching, but did not know for what. A close friend said he was probably going through a phase, a passage in life. Another friend said to try yoga, or learn a new hobby, or take a vacation. There were other suggestions as well, but they all were variations of the same theme, try something new or different. He decided, however, to try something old, planned reflection or meditation. His sensory goal was rather figurative, but yet powerfully effective. His goal was to reflect or meditate 30 minutes a day for 30 days. His vision, as he described it, was, I see myself climbing a steep mountain, and once at the top, of being able to look down into the valleys below with a total perspective able to see all, to synthesize the whole picture, being able to sense the excitement of the climb to the top and yet feel the calm of supreme achievement. Sound. 
The sounds I hear on the pathway to the top are the musical songs of birds, the content murmur of running streams, and the rhythmical beat of my heart as I strive for the top. Touch. I can feel my feet pushing up the hard uphill pathway to the mountaintop. I can also sense the texture of rocks and flowers and the feeling of cold mountain water cooling my feet as I stop by a stream to rest. Smell. I can smell the fragrance of wildflowers that scent the air and the cleanliness of the crisp mountain air. Taste. My taste buds are alive as I sip the nectar of wild honeysuckle and taste the crystal clarity of the mountain water. Emotion. My emotions are clear, strong, and lucid. I draw strength from every step up the path, the strength to endure just one more step. When I reach the top, I feel a sense of personal conquest in my accomplishment. I see clarity in the panorama below me and confidence as I perceive a new mountain peak to be mastered above me. But for a while, I just sit, reflect, and ponder, bringing into powerful synthesis a focus of all the aspects of my life. William's climb to the top came from mentally reflecting on his life for one half hour per day for a period of 30 days. He listed his positive consequences as, I will be able to gain a perspective about who I am, where I come from, and where I am going. This perspective will provide me with a driving force and a purpose for living. It will allow me to be the master over my own mind, body, and circumstances, thus enabling me to control my destiny. It will allow me periods of time to translate my problems into challenges, my challenges into opportunities. It will also allow me to purify my mind, thus cleansing my body, emotions, and spirit. William, with all of the sensory clarity he could muster, would then imagine himself on a high mountain peak, clearly solving his own problems, giving a new perspective to his life. William started this habit two years ago. He still practices it today. He says internal reflection allows him to gain an internal focus, a perspective he's never had before. When you look at him, you believe him. So these are some examples. Now it's time for you to set your sensory goals, to list their consequences following the four steps we outlined earlier. Let me review them once again. First, write the goal statements for at least five desirable behaviors or habits, one in each of the five categories of mental, emotional, physical, financial, and spiritual, or more if you want to add to your arsenal of high achiever behaviors. Second, write them to be results-oriented, measurable, and time-specific, along with a sensory description of what they will be upon completion. Third, write out the consequences of achievement and what you will sense when the consequences come to pass. Fourth, rank the goals so that you have one which is your top priority. After a few minutes of ranking, you will instinctively come to know what is the dominant habit you need to develop above all others. This habit, a behavior you select along with its consequence, will be the sensory goal you will work on for the next 30 days exclusively. Once you become familiar with this process of sensory goal setting, you will be able to apply it to any goal you ever want to achieve, whether it be behavioral, material, or business related. Sensory goal setting will add new dimensions to your life. It will fire your motivation and set into action the electrochemical forces that transform your internal hopes, aspirations, desires, and goals into concrete reality. With sensory goal setting, you can achieve and acquire anything you desire by first sensing it. To paraphrase a common success credo, whatever the mind of man can conceive in rich sensory detail and emotionally believe, the man can achieve. In the next cassette, you will learn the first step in programming your desired high achievement goal into your brain and nervous system. You will learn how to enhance your concentration and sharpen your internal sensory vision through a unique and powerful process of relaxation. What happens inside our brain, nervous system, and body that enables us to think clearly, to concentrate purely, to input and have access to vivid, sensory-rich images of achievement? In this cassette, we'll discuss how tension and stress block clear thinking. You will also learn, step by step, how to dissolve this tension from your body, freeing you to control, concentrate, and direct the power of your mind. This concentrated power 
enables you to etch, like a powerful laser beam, desirable sensory-enriched, success-oriented images of achievement into your brain and nervous system. Before we begin, I'd like to relate to you the experiences of two men which best illustrate the concepts we will be discussing in this cassette. The first, the chief executive officer of one of the largest computer manufacturers in California, has developed a process or a ritual for creative thinking which he goes through every night before he goes to bed. First, he sits down in an armchair and turns on a pre-recorded tape of soft classical music set to a largo rhythm of about 60 beats per minute. Then he lets his mind drift and fantasize to the music. Then he goes to bed, has a relaxing night's sleep. Then in the morning, when he takes his daily shower, new ideas and solutions to problems come pouring into his mind with great intensity. In order to take full advantage of this rapid-fire flow of creativity, he has installed in his shower a waterproof slate with a waterproof pen to record the flow of ideas. The second man, a salesman for a multinational chemical firm, recently told of a personal and somewhat humorous experience I'm sure that you can relate to. He recalled that one morning, when he was in a hurry, rushing to leave home for an important presentation, he could not find his car keys. The harder he searched, the more frustrated he became, and the later he became. Finally, in a state of near desperation, he started screaming at his wife and children, accusing them of having misplaced the keys. He yelled, I always put the keys on the key rack, so someone else must have lost them. They just didn't get up and walk away. Well, lucky for him, he had a wise and understanding wife. She told him to sit down, take a deep breath to clear out his mind. Then she said he would probably remember where he had placed his keys. Following her advice, after a minute or so, he remembered where his keys were. They were in his hands all the time. And yes, this is a true story. I'm sure that you have probably experienced something quite similar to this. It may have been in school while you were taking a test, struggling to recall an answer. The answer was something you knew, but were unable to recall at the moment you needed to know. The more you pressed yourself to remember, the deeper the answer seemed to bury itself into the crevices of your memory. And as soon as you walked out of the testing room, the answer popped crystal clear into your mind. Strange happening, but certainly true. Research has the answer to these fascinating and sometimes disturbing phenomena that we experience from time to time. The answer lies in the adequate supply of oxygen-rich blood to the brain. To enhance creative imaging and crystal-clear thinking, the brain needs oxygen-rich blood in which to bathe its nerve cells and tissues. Oxygen-rich blood fine-tunes the electrochemical interactions in the brain, allowing for laser-like sensory-enriched imaging. Now let's talk about how the brain becomes deprived of this vital oxygen, the life force for pure laser-like vision. You may have heard the psychological term fight-flight response. To explain the meaning of this term, imagine that while you were hiking on a mountain trail, you encountered a big, mean grizzly bear. Your first reaction, of course, would be fear. You would have two choices. One, to either fight the bear, or two, if you're smart, to run. The body automatically prepares you for this fight-flight situation by diverting all available blood from the head, arms, and legs to the heart and stomach area to fuel your instinctive response. The blood vessels in your arms, hands, legs, feet, and head constrict, making sure that all available blood and oxygen is transported to the core of your body. At a time like this, you don't have to think, you react instinctively. Have you ever noticed that when you feel nervous, your hands and feet feel cold or perhaps sweaty? The sweat results from the rapid internal temperature change from warm to cold. Nervousness is caused by some form of fear or worry. Fear of failure, rejection, anger, self-doubt, a lack of confidence. Whenever we generate any self-doubt, worry, or fear, the body reacts in a fight-flight manner. Any fear, no matter how subtle, will trigger the body's physiological mechanism to constrict blood flow to the brain and the fine muscles of the hand, arms, legs, and feet. When muscle tissue is deprived of oxygen-rich blood, it contracts, becoming tight. You feel this as tension. Tension sustained over a period of time is stress. If fear, doubt, or worry is a constant state of mind, a habit, 
the body remains in a constant state of stress. Circulation that carries oxygen-rich blood to the muscles and the brain becomes constricted. Muscles contract. As a result, the holographic processing capability of the brain is also affected. In responding to the fear stimulus, the brain sacrifices much of its vital blood and oxygen supply to nourish the tensed parts of the body. An extreme and classical example of how fear affects the blood supply to the brain is the fainting woman or man passing out when they are surprised and frightened by a mouse. Their sudden fear, a self-imposed reaction to the mouse, triggered the constriction of blood vessels that carry oxygenated blood to the brain. In response to this fear, the blood rushed down to the core of the body, resulting in a temporary undersupply of oxygen to the brain and a temporary loss of consciousness. When the muscles of the body are tense and stressed, the brain, besides not having an adequate supply of blood for itself, is preoccupied with monitoring and regulating blood flow to the tensed muscle tissue. The brain directs the heart to pump harder and faster to force blood through constricted vessels to reach under-oxygenated muscle tissue in the body's extremities. No wonder we find it so hard to concentrate and think clearly when we are under stress. The brain, attending to potentially life-threatening stimuli, works overtime with an undersupply of nutrients. In the example of the salesman who couldn't locate his car keys, his thinking capability was cut off. He was rushing to avoid being late, a worry. He was frustrated because he couldn't locate his keys, and he got angry, resorting to blaming his family for having misplaced his keys. The blood vessels feeding his brain were constricted, blocked with fear, frustration, and anger. He couldn't think. When his wife told him to sit down and take a deep breath, the sudden burst of oxygen from the deep breath gave his brain the necessary nutrients to search out the obvious answer, to unfold the appropriate memory hologram. The keys are in your hand. And in the case of the computer executive who was flooded with ideas, he also experienced the oxygenation effect. His heartbeat became synchronized with the music rhythm of 60 beats per minute, producing an evenly distributed flow of blood throughout his body, creating a soothing, relaxing effect on his muscles. This also enabled him to sleep well at night, allowing his creative images to incubate and take root in his mind. During his morning shower, the pounding water on his body stimulated his blood flow, sending oxygen-rich blood to his brain. This created a nutrient-rich neuroenvironment for the activation and creation of spontaneous and creative mental images. Besides shutting down thinking effectiveness, fear and anxiety result in stress and tension that reduces the body's natural defense mechanisms against disease. It's interesting to note that the word disease means without ease. One without ease is tense and stressed. Tension and stress are the primary causes of heart attack and stroke. Our inability to adapt to rapid changes in our environment, our many fears and anxieties, all add to the fires of stress. Stress, tension, and anxiety can be controlled, controlled by you. Instead of being victimized by the effects of stress, unclear thinking and disease, you can take control of your bodily actions and reactions to fear, anger, and frustration. In this program, you will learn a technique that will enable you to oxygenate parts of your body. This technique will allow you to automatically bathe your brain, nervous system, and muscles in oxygen-rich blood, enabling you to focus and concentrate the power of your holographic brain to create and store sensory-rich images of achievement. Our system of conditioned oxygenation and relaxation will give you a working definition of relaxation. You will learn how to summon this relaxation at will through a technique that uses eye shift patterns, color cues, and the application and release of tension throughout various muscle groups. You will learn a discipline for attaining a high level of relaxation. If you work at these exercises as prescribed, you will find that the ability to relax whenever and wherever you need to eventually will become an automatic reflex. Total relaxation, your ability to dissolve tension, will come to you quite literally in the blink of an eye. For a graphic demonstration of this oxygenation process, try a simple experiment. Clench your fist slowly and flex your forearm and bicep muscles, causing the muscles in your arm to contract. 
Gradually build the tension in your arm and hold it for a count of 10 seconds. Quickly release the tension. You should feel a warm, soothing sensation run through your arm. The feeling that flows through your arm is caused by the revitalizing effect of oxygenated blood flowing to the muscle tissue. Through the exercises outlined in this cassette, you'll be able to capture this feeling of warmth and associate it with a color and an eye movement. Then, after one week of conditioning, you will be able to oxygenate any muscle group in your body by activating that color and eye movement. Before we get into the step-by-step -step program of oxygenation conditioning, let's define what we mean by a conditioned or automatic reflex or response. Just after the turn of the century, Russian psychologist Ivan Petrovich Pavlov discovered the phenomenon of the conditioned reflex. In his famous experiments, dogs were presented with meat. Upon presentation of the food, the dogs began to salivate. Every time the food was presented, Pavlov rang a bell over a period of weeks, the dogs became so conditioned to this routine that eventually the mere sounding of the bell, when not accompanied by the presentation of food, was sufficient to cause them to salivate. Recent brain and physiological research shows that just about any bodily function or response can be conditioned. We can condition ourselves and our nervous systems to respond to a cue or symbol. If that cue or symbol is associated in the mind with a certain body response, then flashing that code into the mind will activate that desired body response. In our oxygenation relaxation conditioning program, we use color cues, a separate color to activate blood flow to each of the body's three major muscle zones, the lower torso, upper torso, and head. In this program, you will learn to mentally beam a color into each of these muscle groups. Then you'll learn to associate that color with the release of tension and the warm, relaxed feeling caused by oxygenated blood rushing to the muscle tissue. This may sound somewhat complicated now, but as you listen to the rest of this cassette and follow the instructions in your study book, it will all fall into place. In the study guide, you'll find two drawings of the human muscular system. Turn to the section in your study guide entitled Laser Vision, Sharpening Concentration, and Internal Vision Through Relaxation Oxygenation Conditioning. Locate the drawing of the human body. Each drawing will divide the body into three zones. Each zone has its corresponding muscle groups. Each of the zones is associated with a color as follows. Zone 1, the lower torso, consists of the right leg, left leg, and buttocks. The color we'll associate with this muscle group is red. Zone 2, the upper torso, includes the muscles of the abdomen, chest, right arm, left arm, and back. The color for association is orange. In zone 3, we have the muscles of the forehead and scalp, eyes, cheeks, nose, lips, chin, jaw, throat, and the neck. Our conditioning color for these muscles is yellow. Before you learn the procedure for relaxation oxygenation conditioning, First, complete the recommended exercise in your study guide. This will prepare you for the relaxation oxygenation conditioning session, which will be presented to you on the other side of this tape. Now that you have reviewed your study guide and have completed the recommended exercises, coloring the three body zones with their appropriate colors, and listing and labeling the three major body zones with their respective muscle groups, you are now ready to have your first experience in relaxation oxygenation conditioning. On this tape, you will learn how to automatically relax the muscles in your body with oxygen-rich blood. This relaxation will sharpen your concentration and facilitate the flow of sensory images in your mind. Together, we'll walk through the procedure step by step. The purpose of this tape is to give you a framework of how you should conduct your own personal conditioning sessions. Do not become dependent on this tape as a crutch to put yourself through the exercise. You must be in full control, not some voice on a tape giving you instructions. Use this tape only as a model of what you should be doing. Then try to memorize each of the steps so that you can become self-sufficient. Each of the steps for this procedure is also listed in the study guide. To make relaxation a conditioned response, you should complete this relaxation oxygenation exercise twice a day for one week. 
If possible, do the exercise first thing in the morning, while you are still fresh, and early in the evening. Avoid this exercise when you are tired or in bed, or you may find that your eye code and color cues will condition a sleep response. If you are an insomniac, then it might be helpful to do the exercise while in bed. After the first week, switch to the abbreviated intermediate exercise outlined in your study guide. However, you should continue to keep the conditioning process active by completing the full relaxation oxygenation exercise once per week. Make it a lifetime habit. You will find that the results make it worthwhile. Before we begin, let's cover six preliminaries and then move right into the program. First, find yourself a comfortable chair or a couch. A reclining chair is ideal. The idea is to have the chair support your body weight totally. You don't want to sense any part of the body supporting itself because that can cause competing tension. Second, you should be dressed comfortably, perhaps in a warm-up suit or in loose-fitting clothes. The aim is to avoid any clothing that is binding or weighty. Be sure to remove your shoes, glasses, watch, rings, belt, and any other similar objects. You need to feel completely unrestricted. Third, sit or recline with your legs extended and arms at your side so that your body is totally supported by the chair or couch. Fourth, if during the tension portion of the exercise you experience a cramp, the legs are particularly susceptible, don't panic. Instead, try this sensory technique. Imagine the constricted muscle as a hard, cold ball of butter. Then imagine a warm flow of blood flooding into the muscle, melting the butter, dissolving the cramp. Fifth, if you have any kind of injury, back, shoulder, leg, etc., be sure not to tense that area beyond the threshold of pain. Pain is the body's warning to cease and desist. And finally, one last note before we begin. The exercise instructions are for a right-handed person. If you are left-handed and have found that your upper left and right eye movements are the reverse of right-handers, then reverse the upper left and upper right eye shift movements, but only those two movements when they are prescribed. We will not use auditory eye movements in relaxation training. Now, close your eyes and calm your body and mind for a moment. As a warm-up and sensory sharpening exercise for color recall, mentally recall the colors for the three color zones. Using the upper left eye shift if you are right-handed, remember for some left-handers, use the upper right. Slowly bring to mind the colors red, orange, and yellow in that order. You don't have to really see the colors, but merely sense them. When you perform your eye shift movements, it is not necessary to keep them in the eye shift position. Just slowly move both eyes to the position as a signal to the brain that you are activating that sensory channel and then back to a normal resting position. If you put too much pressure on the eyes, you will create a slight tension headache. Now you are ready to begin associating the colors with the relaxation of the three body zones. This oxygenation relaxation exercise is designed to enhance that color association, to make it a conditioned reflex, and at the same time to provide a clear distinction between the feeling of tension and the warm glow of relaxation. Let's begin with the first muscle zone, zone one, or the lower torso. It consists of the muscles of the right leg, left leg, and buttocks. The conditioning color for oxygenation of the lower torso is red. With an upper left eye shift, key into the color red. Again, this is the conditioning color for the lower torso. Sense in rich, vivid detail the picture of the muscle groups in your study guide you colored red. With a lower right eye shift, mentally isolate the muscles of your lower torso. First the right leg then the left leg, 
and finally the buttocks. Focus your attention on these muscle groups and mentally scan them. Now, slowly build up tension in the right leg, left leg, and buttocks by progressively tightening all of the muscles associated with the lower torso. You'll feel the tension build up as circulation becomes restricted and muscles become starved of oxygen. Now, slowly, Count to ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. And with an upper right eye shift, quickly release the tension. Project the color red into the muscles of the lower torso with a burst of laser-like color from an imaginary laser gun. It is important to time this mental projection of color with the point of release of tension. Now, with a lower right eye shift, shift your entire attention on the glow of relaxation that flows into the lower torso as a result of the flood of oxygenated blood into the muscles. Maintain this focus for a few moments as you capture the feeling of oxygenated muscle tissue, the sense of relaxation flooding in. Literally bask in this warm feeling of relaxation as you feel tension melt away and the oxygen-starved muscles hungrily soaking up nourishment. Now with an upper right eye shift, construct a mental picture of a red mist, vapor or fog, slowly circulating around the head. Slowly inhale a long, deep stream of this red, mist-filled, oxygen-rich air, totally filling the chest cavity to capacity. Hold this breath for a slow count of five. One, two, three, four, five. Now with a lower right eye shift, slowly release the air back through the nostrils and sense the feeling of oxygen saturating the muscles of the lower torso, heightening the sense of relaxation flowing down through the legs and buttocks. Concentrate on and stay with this feeling for a few moments. Now let's move up to the upper torso, the muscles of the abdomen, chest, right arm, left arm, and back. The conditioning color to activate oxygenation of any muscle group of the upper torso is orange. With an upper left eye shift, sense from memory the color orange. This is the activation color for relaxation oxygenation conditioning of the upper torso. Recall in rich, vivid detail the picture of the upper torso muscle groups you colored orange in your study guide.
with a lower right eye shift, mentally isolate the muscles of the upper torso, the abdomen, chest, right arm, left arm, and back muscles. Focus your attention on these muscles and mentally scan this zone beginning with the abdominal muscles working up through the chest then down the right arm, up the left arm and then through the muscles of the back mentally sensing and feeling each muscle group. Now, slowly build up tension in the abdomen, chest, right arm, left arm, and back by progressively tightening all of the muscles associated with the upper torso. You'll feel the tension build as circulation becomes restricted and muscles become starved of oxygen. Now, Slowly, count to ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. And with an upper right eye shift, quickly release the tension. Project the color orange into the muscles of the upper torso with a burst of color from your imaginary laser gun. It is important to time this mental projection of color with the point of release of tension. Now with a lower right eye shift, shift your entire attention on the glow of relaxation that flows into the upper torso as a result of the flood of oxygenated blood into the muscles. Maintain this focus for a few moments as you capture the feeling of oxygenated muscle tissue, the sense of relaxation flooding in. Literally bask in this warm feeling of relaxation as you feel tension melt away and the oxygen-starved muscles hungrily soak up nourishment. Now, with an upper right eye shift, construct a mental picture of an orange mist, vapor, or fog slowly circulating around the head. Slowly inhale a long, deep stream of this orange, mist-filled, oxygen-rich air simultaneously through each nostril, totally filling the chest cavity to capacity. Hold this breath for the slow count of five. One, two, three, four, five. With a lower right eye shift, slowly release the air back through the nostrils and sense the feeling of oxygen saturating the muscles of the upper torso, heightening the sense of relaxation flowing through the abdomen, chest, right arm, left arm, and back muscles. Concentrate on and stay with this feeling for a few moments.
Now, let's move up to the muscles of the head. The forehead, scalp, cheeks, nose, lips, jaw, throat, and the back of the neck. The conditioning color to activate oxygenation of the head muscles is yellow. With an upper left eye shift, sense the color yellow. Yellow is the activation color for relaxation oxygenation conditioning for the muscle groups in the head. Recall in rich, vivid detail the picture of the muscle groups you colored yellow in your study guide. With a lower right eye shift, mentally isolate the muscles of the head, the forehead, scalp, cheeks, nose, lips, jaw, and throat, and the muscles of the back of the neck. Focus your attention on these muscles and mentally scan this zone, beginning with the forehead scalp muscles, working through the muscles of the face to the throat and then to the back of the neck. Now, slowly build tension in the total head and neck area by progressively tightening all the muscles associated with the head zone, beginning with the forehead and scalp, then going to the cheeks, nose, lips, jaw, throat, and back of the neck. Now, slowly count to ten. One, two, three, four, Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And with an upper right eye shift, quickly release the tension and simultaneously project the color yellow into the muscles of the head and neck. Now with a lower right eye shift, focus your entire attention on the glow of relaxation that flows into the muscle groups of the head and neck area as a result of the flood of oxygenated blood into the muscles. Maintain this focus for a few moments as you capture this feeling of oxygenated muscle tissue, this sense of relaxation is flooding in. Literally bask in the warm feeling of relaxation as you feel tension melting away and the oxygen-starved muscles hungrily soaking up nourishment. Now with an upper right eye shift, construct a mental picture of a yellow mist, vapor, or fog slowly circulating around your head. Now slowly inhale a long, deep stream of this yellow mist-filled oxygen-rich air simultaneously through each nostril, totally filling the chest cavity to capacity. Hold this breath for a slow count of five. 
One, two, three, four, five. With the lower right eye shift, slowly release the air back through the nostrils and sense the feeling of oxygen saturating the muscles of the head and neck area. Heighten the sense of relaxation flowing down through the scalp, forehead, cheeks, lips, jaw, chin, throat, and neck. Concentrate on and stay with this feeling for a few moments. And now, let's conclude the oxygenation exercise. With a central focus eye shift, slowly reverse the colors working down from the yellow to orange to red and associate each color with its specific body zone. Now, slowly open your eyes and slowly shake out your arms and legs. At this point, you'll feel like you just awoke from a short nap. Gradually, you'll feel vitalized and clear-minded. The object of this exercise is to make relaxation a conditioned reflex. Over a period of one week, you should become totally at home with the basic exercise of tensing and releasing the tension. Then by following the instructions in the study guide, you'll learn to pare it down to an abbreviated form. When you reach that point of full oxygenation conditioning in about four weeks, relaxation will come quickly by using a central position eye shift and quickly zeroing in on each of the three color cues. This takes only seconds. It means that the ability to relax has indeed become a conditioned reflex. It is, however, a process that cannot be hurried. It must happen naturally, and the time it takes for relaxation to become an automatic response will vary with the individual. So please, give it time. This applies to the entire discipline contained in this program of which relaxation is a part. Allow the results to happen naturally. By forcing yourself, you only create an environment of tension and anxiety. The Neuropsychology of Achievement program is not a quick-fix overnight success program. To enjoy the benefits of the program, you must work hard. The initial weeks of your training can be likened to the germination period of an oak tree. The acorn is planted and takes many months to germinate. If, out of impatience, we uproot the seed to check its growth, the germination process will stop. Looking at the uprooted seed, it appears the same as it was before it was planted. But within the cells of the acorn seed, wonderful things were taking place that would have allowed the seed to become a mighty oak if only given the chance to grow. So, be patient. It takes time and hard work to change old self-defeating habits and to ingrain new ones. Let it happen naturally. But instead of months and years like the acorn, your germination and growth process will begin to unfold in a matter of weeks. And the next step in that growth process will be explained on the next cassette. You will learn how to code desirable high achievement behaviors into your holographic brain and nervous system. Before you learn to code or program your brain and nervous system with your desirable high achiever behaviors, it is important that you acquire a greater understanding of how your sensory processor works. Knowing precisely in which areas of the brain certain kinds of mental processes occur will help you to improve your brain coding ability. Functionally, the brain is divided into two sections, the left cerebral hemisphere and the right cerebral hemisphere. The hemispheres resemble a walnut shell. 
knitting the two sides together, is a four inch long body of closely packed fiber called the corpus callosum, a structure of nervous tissue and fiber that acts as a bridge for the transfer and sharing of electrical impulses and information that travel between the left and right cerebral hemispheres. For your reference, the brain with its two hemispheres and corpus callosum is graphically illustrated in your study guide. In the late 1930s, brain surgeons attempted to control epileptic seizures in some of their patients by severing the corpus callosum, cutting the neural bridge that unites the two hemispheres of the brain. In some patients, the seizures completely stopped, but more remarkably, the split brain patients showed no changes in personality, mental capacities, or behavior. Scientists had long thought the corpus callosum to be an important link to behavior and learning capacity. But if severing this major nerve pathway had no effect on brain functions, what purpose did it serve? In the early 1960s, physiologist Roger Sperry at the California Institute of Technology set out to solve the mystery of the corpus callosum, to discover its functions by testing people whose corpus callosum had been surgically severed. In eventually discovering its purpose, Sperry uncovered an even greater mystery. Man appeared to have two brains. Sperry designed research to probe the functions of the dual brain. For his findings, in 1982, he received the Nobel Prize. Sperry, in describing his findings, wrote, Each hemisphere of the brain seems to have its own separate and private sensations, its own perceptions, its own impulses to act with related volitional, cognitive, and learning experience. Sperry discovered that man unquestionably has two minds, one specializing in analytical and verbal skills, the other adept in sensory processing and emotion. The left cerebral hemisphere serves as the thinking side of the brain. Its function is rational and logical thinking, reading, writing, arithmetic, and mental construction. The left side of the brain is, in essence, the thinking man. It handles the planning, organizing, and direction of the thinking being. The right cerebral hemisphere handles nonverbal functions and the processing of sensory information relating to sight, sound, touch, smell, taste, and emotions. The right side of the brain is the source of instinctive conditioned reflexes. The corpus callosum, Sperry found, allows both the right and left hemispheres to share information. It serves as a communications link between the right and left hemispheres. In this cassette, you will learn to input your goal statements, the sensory components of your goal, and their consequences into the appropriate areas of your brain. The brain coding exercise is an add-on to the oxygenation relaxation exercise. It begins only after you have completed the first phase of the oxygenation program, when you have graduated from the basic exercise to the intermediate exercise outlined in your study guide. As you recall, we suggested that the basic exercise in the oxygenation program should be a twice-a-day regimen for a minimum of one week. Once you are beyond this stage, simply add the following competence programming process onto the intermediate relaxation program. As we explained earlier in this cassette, the brain is divided into three basic areas, the left hemisphere, the right hemisphere, and the corpus callosum. These complement the three basic body zones, zone one, the lower torso, zone two, the upper torso, and zone three, the head and facial areas. The zones and associated color cues for access into the brain are as follows for all right-handed people and some left-handers. Zone four, the left hemisphere, whose function is rational thinking, verbalization, and construction. The color we associate with the left hemisphere is green. Zone five, the right hemisphere, the localized area for the processing of sight, sound, touch, taste, smell, and emotional impressions. Its color association is blue. Zone 6, the corpus callosum, a band of nervous tissue and fiber that acts as a bridge for the transfer of electrical impulses between the left and right hemispheres. Its color for conditioning is violet.
If you are a pure left-hander and your eye shift movements for visual and auditory processing were the reverse of the right-handed person, the functions of your left and right brains will also be reversed. For example, your right brain would process analytical information instead of sensory impressions. Your left brain would process sensory impressions rather than analytical and verbal detail. So in the following exercise, make the appropriate adjustments by reversing the visual and auditory eye shift codes and left and right brain functions. Before you begin the competence programming process, turn off your cassette recorder and complete the prescribed exercises in your study guide. Then, after you have completed the exercises, turn your recorder back on and we will continue. In the following exercise, you will use your eye shift movements. As you do, please remember that your eye movements should be slow, gentle glides. When you reach the appropriate position, hold it for only a few seconds. Then release and let your eyes return to their normal, relaxed position. In this relaxed position, you will be able to open up the appropriate sensory channels into and out of your brain. The important thing is that you first signaled your brain with the proper eye movement prior to sensory input and recall. Because the competence programming exercise is simply added to the intermediate exercise in the oxygenation program, you already will have taken all of the preliminary steps. You should be sitting in a comfortable chair or lying down on the floor or on a couch. You should be dressed comfortably in loose-fitting clothes with all binding or restricting objects removed. Here, then, is your basic competence programming exercise. Let's begin with the first step, relaxation, beginning with the lower torso. With an upper left eye shift code, key into the color red. Red is the oxygenation color for the lower torso. Recall in as much visual detail the picture of the muscle groups you colored red in your study guide. Glide down to a lower right eye shift code and scan the lower torso, right leg, left leg, and buttocks area. Gently move up to an upper right eye shift code. Mentally beam and flood the entire lower torso with the color red. Finally, move smoothly down to a lower right eye shift code. Capture the warm sensation of circulating oxygen-rich blood flowing throughout the muscles of your lower torso, dissolving and melting away concentration-sapping tension. Now let's go to the upper torso. With an upper left eye shift code, key into the color orange, the oxygenation conditioning color for the upper torso. Recall in as much visual detail as you possibly can the picture of the muscle groups you colored orange in your study guide. Glide down to a lower right eye shift code and scan the muscles of the entire upper torso, abdomen, chest, right arm, left arm, and back. Moving gently up to an upper right eye shift code, Beam and flood the entire upper torso with the color orange.
then back down to a lower right eye shift code. Feel and capture the warm sensation of oxygenated blood dissolving tension in the muscle tissue of the upper torso. Now let's move to the muscles of the head, face, and neck. With an upper left eye shift code, key into the color yellow. This is the oxygenation conditioning color for the muscles of the head, face, and neck. Recall in rich, vivid detail the picture of the muscle groups of the head, face, and neck you colored yellow in your study guide. With a lower right eye shift code, scan the entire head, the scalp, forehead, and eyes the cheeks, nose, and lips, the chin, jaw, throat, and back of the neck. Moving to an upper right eye shift code, mentally beam and flood the muscles of the head, face, and neck with the color yellow. And now move down to a lower right eye shift code. Capture the warm sensation of oxygenated blood dissolving tension in the muscle tissues of the head, face, and the neck. Let's now move into the three regions of the brain. Zone 4, the left brain. Zone 5, the right brain. And Zone 6, the corpus callosum. With an upper left eye shift code, recall from memory the color green. This is the access and oxygenation color for the left cerebral hemisphere. Recall in vivid detail the picture of the left hemisphere you colored green in your study guide. With a lower right eye shift code, scan the left side of your brain, isolating it from the rest of your body awareness. With an upper right eye shift code, construct a mental picture of a green mist circulating around your forehead. Slowly breathe in the mist through your nose, filling your chest cavity to maximum. Hold the breath for a count of five. One, two, three, four, and five. Now, slowly exhale. Shift slowly to a lower right eye shift code. As you exhale, sense a clearing and a mental sharpening of clarity and focus in your left cerebral hemisphere.
Now, bring your eyes to the central focus position and let them naturally rest there for a few moments. With a lateral right eye shift code, mentally verbalize your goal statement and consequences you will derive when you achieve it. And with a central focus, bring the eyes to the center position, letting them rest. Now, let us go over to the right brain, your sensory processor. With an upper left eye shift code, key into the color blue. This is the access and oxygenating color for the right hemisphere. Recall with vivid detail the picture of the right hemisphere you have colored blue in your study guide. With a lower right eye shift code, scan the right side of the brain, isolating it from the rest of your body's awareness. Moving up to an upper right eye shift code, Construct an imaginary blue mist circulating around your forehead. Slowly bring the mist in through your nose, filling your chest cavity to maximum. Hold the breath for a count of five. One, two, three, four, five. Now, slowly exhale. Glide down to a lower right eye shift code. And as you exhale, sense a clearing and a mental sharpening of clarity and focus in your right hemisphere. Now bring your eyes to the central focus position letting them naturally rest there for a few moments. With an upper right eye shift code, visually construct in clear detail the visual element of your sensory goal statement. With a lateral right eye shift code, mentally hear, in precise detail, the sounds associated with your sensory goal. Now with a lower right eye shift code, feel in vivid detail the body sensations associated with your sensory goal.
moving to a 10 degree upper central eye shift code. Sense in vivid detail the sensations of smell associated with your sensory goal. With a 10 degree lower central eye shift code, sense in vivid detail the tastes associated with your sensory goal. Then with a lower left I shift code, sense the powerful emotional feelings associated with your sensory goal. Let the emotions bloom and expand within you. And finally, slowly move your eyes into a central focus position and relax them for a few moments. Now you will join via the corpus callosum, your left brain's verbal goal statement, with your right brain's sensory goal impressions. You will do this by pre-living the realization of your goal in full sensory detail. With an upper left eye shift code, recall from memory the color violet. This is the access and oxygenation color for the corpus callosum. Recall in vivid detail the picture of the corpus callosum you colored violet in the study guide. With a lower right eye shift code, go deep within your brain and mentally sense your corpus callosum, isolating it from the rest of your body awareness. Scan the area from the front of your brain to the back, from the top of your brain to the bottom, and from the left side to the right side. Glide upward to an upper right eye shift code. Construct an imaginary violet mist circulating around the forehead. Slowly inhale the mist through your nose, filling your chest cavity to maximum. Hold the breath for a count of five. One, two, three, four, five. Then slowly exhale. As you exhale, move to a lower right eye shift code and sense a sharpening of concentration, clarity, and focus, a feeling of unification between the left and right hemispheres. With a central focus eye shift code, let your eyes rest for a few moments.
Then, still centrally focused, freely the goal as being realized in its full sensory clarity, in as much precise detail as you possibly can. Involve all of your imagination and senses. Generate emotion and feel the emotion overtake your mind, body, and senses. In conclusion, while you are in a central position, slowly reverse the colors, working down from violet to blue, blue to green, green to yellow, yellow to orange. and orange to red. After you recall red, slowly open your eyes and slowly shake out your arms and legs. You will feel rested, relaxed, and vitalized. You should continue this competence programming exercise for a period of one week, twice per day. This will allow your brain's sensory channels to become grooved and will allow your mind enough time to associate the colors with the appropriate areas of your brain. This will take approximately one week for this conditioning process to occur. Then simply with the activation of a color, with your eyes in the central focus position, you will be able to have access to any area of your holographic brain to store and replay your images of success. The following words of Thomas Kempis capture the meaning and power of self-discipline, the control one has over oneself and the principle we will discuss in this cassette. Kempis writes, He who is living without discipline is exposed to grievous ruin. Who hath a harder battle to fight than he who striveth for self-mastery? And this should be our endeavor, even to master self, and thus daily grow stronger than self, and go unto perfection. The stage has now been set. We reach the point of reality. You have identified and prioritized the high achiever habit you want to possess. You have developed that habit into a lucid sensory goal statement with a list of positive consequences. You have learned a system of automatic muscle relaxation, and you have learned how to code the habit into your brain and nervous system by using specific eye shift patterns and colors. Now we come to the point where the forces of your deeply ingrained underachiever habit, that villain entrenched in your brain that keeps you from becoming and doing that which you really desire, and the high achiever habit you selected for yourself, that hero or heroine in your drama of behavioral change, clash in a battle to determine who really has control over your life. In this cassette, you will be introduced to a beautifully simple yet powerful technique that will allow you to control and extinguish any self-defeating behavior or habit. This will allow your desirable high achiever behavior, the habit that you have already implanted in your brain's holographic processor, to take root and become a dominant driving force in your life. Simply stated, you will learn how to condition your negative self-defeating habit to a negative symbol a hairy green caricature of a cockroach with beady little eyes and pointed razor-sharp teeth. And you'll learn how to condition your desired high achiever habit to a positive symbol, a caricature of an armor-clad sword-wielding warrior who bears the head of an eagle with strong, powerful wings that allow it to soar above the clouds of mediocrity and with shining, penetrating laser-like eyes that signify sensory sharpness and sensitivity. The positive symbol we will call simply the high achiever. The high achiever is a symbol of confidence and strength, of mental, emotional, physical, financial, and spiritual control. It is the embodiment of the high achiever in his or her full glory. Our positive high achiever symbol 
exudes solid aggressiveness and total self-assurance. His armor represents a psychological shield that prevents any self-defeating behavior from penetrating and taking root in his body, brain, and nervous system. The negative symbol, the bad guy, we call the demon. Looking at this uncouth little character, he appears as if he is mocking and taunting you with his thumbs in his ears and his bony, hairy fingers dancing wildly in the air, screeching, I've got you now, just try to get rid of me, I dare you. You will find the picture of the high achiever and demon symbols in your study guide. It is significant to point out that we use the cockroach as the symbol for self-defeating habits because like self-defeating habits, once you have them, they are hard to get rid of. Cockroaches lurk in the darkness of night and as soon as they glimpse the light of day, they slither back to their dark hiding places. In an effort to get rid of them, you can spray them with the most potent of pesticides, but the cockroach won't die. It has been sprayed so many times with so many substances, it has built up an immunity, a resistance. If by chance you should step on one in the dark, you might hear an awful crunching sound, thinking that you might have squashed it, but the dirty old cockroach seems to regain his composure and hobbles right back to its hiding place, seeming to hiss and curse as it limps along. The only way to get rid of this pest is to trap him in a baited box. And once he is in your control, you can once and for all terminate him. As you can see, cockroaches and bad habits have a lot in common. Well, we have the high achiever representing your desirable positive habit, and we have the demon, that unsavory little character representing your self-defeating habits. Once you have conditioned your bad habit to the demon and your good habit to the high achiever symbol, then whenever the self-defeating habit rears its ugly head, in the form of the demon, of course, you can command the high achiever symbol to terminate it, to extinguish it, and rid it forever from your nervous system. You will do this by leading your high achiever symbol in a vivid, sensory-rich, three-dimensional battle against the demon, a battle in which the demon will be unmercifully eliminated. The beauty of this simple system is that it allows you to take behaviors that were once unconscious and bring them to the conscious level, to embody them in concrete symbols, symbols that you can control. And if the behaviors or habits are properly conditioned to the symbols, that is, if you associated the behaviors and the symbols with sensory-rich images, the brain will not be able to tell the difference between the symbol and the behavior it represents. And maybe, for the first time in your life, you will have a concrete handle to control all of your behaviors. You will be able to act upon your sensory environment, external and internal, rather than having it act upon you. Let's see how this concept works in real life. Let's pretend, for example, that you cannot control your desire to eat donuts. And whenever you think of a donut or drive past a donut shop, your full sensory computer is activated. You can vividly see the luscious donuts, taste and smell them in exquisite detail. You can sense their soft, doughy touch, and you hear that little voice within you saying, it's okay, one or two won't hurt. In fact, you've really earned it. You worked so hard today. This complete sensory stimulus triggers an almost uncontrollable response. You buy a dozen donuts, thinking that you'll save some for your children at home. But when you get in the car, on the way home, you eat the whole dozen by rationalizing that you love your kids so much you don't want to poison their systems. And after you finish your dozen, you feel terrible. Your self-respect and self-image drops as many notches as your belt size increases. If you would have conditioned the demon to your self-defeating munching behavior and the high achiever symbol to donut abstinence, here's what would have happened. Let's pretend again that you're driving home from work. It's been a trying day, and your mind is occupied in reliving a successful achievement of the day, when all of a sudden, up pops the demon. Turn in here, he says, pointing to the donut shop. Your old response would be to flip on the turn signal, wait for the light to change, and duck in and buy a dozen. But today is different. Today, just as soon as the demon pops up, you call into action your high achiever symbol, who squarely faces the demon, and without hesitation, initiates a battle. Remember, the demon has been around a long time, and he has learned all the tricks of appealing to your weaknesses by teasing your senses with the taste, sight, smell, and feel of those dangerous donuts. 
Your high achiever symbol, though, is just as strong, if not stronger, because you have endowed him with greater power. The vision, taste, smell, feel, and emotion of what you will be like after you acquire the habit of diet control. You have also given your positive symbol the description of the specific positive consequences you will experience when you achieve your goal. Well, your high achiever symbol has three choices of behavior from which to choose. He can intellectually argue the demon out of the way and thrash him soundly as you would an opponent in a college debate. Or he can get emotional and mentally shout him off the stage. Or if you're the physical type and feel the sense of the warrior in you, you can engage your high achiever symbol in classical hand-to-hand -hand combat. He draws the blade and hacks the demon to shreds. He tears him apart until literally there is nothing left. You may have to resort to any of these three, or maybe all three, but in the end the demon falls and your high achiever symbol is victorious. Actually, you win, because through the power of self-discipline you have acquired a new positive and useful behavior. That's the way you have programmed your brain and the demon loses. You have extinguished an old, sorry, and useless behavioral habit. You have made the conscious decision to take control and you drive past your temptation. This victory solidifies your will and increases your self-respect. Don't let the simplicity of this approach to behavioral change fool you. Don't underestimate its effectiveness as a powerful tool for personal control because it sounds like a child's game. It's not a child's game. It takes intense self-control and discipline, and it works, or your brain allows it to work, if you only give it a chance. It will take approximately one week to realize the benefits of this conditioning process. Once you learn the technique, you can plug in any positive or negative behavior to the symbols in just a matter of minutes. Then you'll have a concrete reign of control over your behavior and habits. You will now be introduced to a procedure of conditioning or coding your self-defeating habits and your desirable high achiever habits to the demon and high achiever symbols. For practice, let's use the prioritized high achiever habit you desire to acquire and the current behaviors and habits that you want to get rid of. These will be the input for your session. Let's first condition your desirable high achiever habit to the high achiever symbol. You will need a visual picture of the high achiever symbol to refer to. Either use the picture in the study guide or create your own. Now, let's begin. Sitting in a comfortable chair or sofa, close your eyes and slowly shift them to the upper left. And with an upper left eye shift code, recall from memory the colors red, orange, yellow, green, and blue. Remember, if you're left-handed, your visual and auditory eye shifts might be the reverse of a right-hander. Open your eyes, and with an upper left eye shift code, focus on the picture of the high achiever symbol. Focus on the fine detail, the eagle head with the razor-sharp beak and penetrating eyes, the strong, widespread wings, the sharp sword, and the protective armor. Then, with an upper right eye shift code, with your eyes still open, visually sense the consequences of your goal being realized, what you will visually perceive when you have achieved it, all the while maintaining a focus on the symbol. With a lower left eye shift code, create and pre-live the strong emotions associated with the consequences of having achieved your habit goal. All the while, maintain a focus on the symbol.
Now, go to a lower right eye shift code and pre-live the bodily sensations you will feel as a consequence of achieving your highly desirable high achiever habit. Again, maintain a focus on the symbol. Now, while maintaining a focus on the symbol, go to a lateral right eye shift code and pre-live the sounds, voices, and self-talk you will experience as a result of achieving your high achiever habit. Glide up to an upper 10 degree central eye shift code and create a pleasant smell associated with the consequences of achieving your high achiever habit. Again, maintain a focus on the symbol. Slip down to a lower 10 degree central eye shift code and create a pleasant taste in your mouth, associating it with the consequences of achieving your high achiever habit, all the while maintaining a focus on the symbol. Now go to a central focus eye shift code. Merge and fuse all of the sensory details of the positive consequences you realize by achieving your high achiever habit, all the while maintaining a focus on the symbol. Now, very slowly, close your eyes and let the after images still being processed by the optic nerves wear off. With your eyes closed, go to a central focus eye shift code and merge in full visual detail the picture of the high achiever symbol with the sight, emotions, body sensations, sounds, taste, and smell of the positive consequences you would experience as a result of achieving your high achiever habit. Having worked through these steps, you have experienced how to condition your high achiever habit to the high achiever symbol. Now, let's condition your opposite self-defeating habit to the demon symbol. Open your eyes and going to an upper left eye shift code, focus your attention on the fine detail of the demon. Its head, eyes, teeth, body, hands, claws, etc. Then, with a lower left eye shift code, recall from emotional memory and relive emotionally 
all of the undesirable consequences associated with your underachiever habit, all the while maintaining a focus on the demon symbol. Now, glide to a lower right eye shift code and recall the physical sensations or consequences associated with the self-defeating habit, all the while maintaining a focus on the demon symbol. Go to a lateral left eye shift code and recall the sound, voices of other people, and self-talk relating to the negative consequences of your self-defeating behavior, all the while maintaining a focus on the demon symbol. Now, glide up to an upper 10 degree central eye shift code and recall or relate an unpleasant smell that you want to associate with the negative consequences of your self-defeating behavior, all the while maintaining a focus on the demon symbol. Shift down to a lower 10 degree central eye shift code and recall or relate an unpleasant taste associated with the negative consequences of your self-defeating behavior, all the while maintaining a focus on the demon symbol. Now, go to a central focus eye shift code. Merge and fuse all of the sensory details of the negative consequences of your self-defeating behavior, all the while maintaining a focus on the demon symbol. Very slowly, close your eyes and let the after images still being processed by your optic nerves wear off. Go to a central focus eye shift code and merge in full visual detail the picture of the demon symbol with the sensory emotions body sensations, sounds, taste, and smell of the negative consequences of your self-defeating behavior. After you have learned how to condition the high achiever and self-defeating habits respectively, you can begin to control your habitual behaviors by controlling the symbols. Put your good guy and bad guy to work for you. When you feel yourself being enticed by a self-defeating stimulus, slipping into your old underachiever habit pattern, you can diffuse those self-defeating temptations instantly by going through the following exercise. When you become accomplished at performing this exercise, you will be able to do it in a few seconds. With eyes closed, 
Go to an upper right eye shift code. Engage the demon and the high achiever symbols in an imaginary battle. Imagine in as much vivid detail as possible the high achiever totally destroying the demon. Upper left eye shift code. Recall from memory as vividly as possible the positive symbol of the high achiever. Lower left I shift code. Sense the emerging strong emotions associated with the victorious symbol. Upper left eye shift code. Visually recall as vividly as possible a picture of yourself. Upper right eye shift code. Merge the picture of yourself into a picture of the high achiever symbol. Central focus I shift code. Capture the total sensory impact of the emotions, sights, sounds, taste, smells, and bodily sensations that accompany the merging of yourself with a symbol of the high achiever. As a result of previous conditioning, the feelings, sensory sights, sounds, tastes and smell, emotions and bodily sensations you associated with the high achiever symbol will surface. After you master this technique, you will be able to control and extinguish any self-defeating counterforce or stimulus that attempts to incite a self-defeating habitual response and instantly replace it with a high achiever response. In this cassette, you will learn a 30-day action plan that will enable you to internalize and make permanent your chosen high achiever habit. Before you become acquainted with this 30-day action plan, let's review for a moment what you've accomplished so far in the Neuropsychology of Achievement program. First, you learn that the power of visualization can be explained by modeling the function of the brain on holography. You learn that sensory-rich images filled with emotion, possess energy that influences your body, mind, and concrete world. Second, you learn that your eye is an extension of your brain. Besides acting as the organ of vision, select patterns of eye movement open up pathways to your brain for the input and recall of sensory-rich images. Third, you were introduced to a research-based model of 21 characteristic behaviors and habits of the high achiever. Fourth, you compared yourself against the high achiever model and identified the high achiever habits you would like to possess. You prioritized those habits and selected one high achiever habit you would like to acquire. You also wrote a habit goal statement that listed in rich sensory detail the elements of your desired habit. 
fifth, you were introduced to a powerful discipline that enabled you to code the desirable high achiever habit into your brain and nervous system. You learned that the first step of this process was to clear the body and mind of tension and stress. You learned a technique to automatically relax any muscle group in your body through the activation of an eye movement. You then learned how to gain access into your holographic brain and you learned a method of programming that allowed you to input your desirable detailed high achiever habit into your brain and nervous system. You also learned a powerful technique of self-discipline using the high achiever and demon symbols. Now you will learn how to internalize and make permanent your chosen high achiever habit. Developing a new habit to replace an old one, especially if you attempt to dislodge a self-defeating habit, takes time and practice. Vince Lombardi used to say that it was not practice that makes perfect, but perfect practice that makes perfect. This program is the most perfect system of neuropsychological processing in existence today that will allow your daily practice time, the time you spend in acquiring your new behavior, to be perfect. Any other system or approach that does not incorporate the principles detailed in this program, plus the effort it takes to put these principles into action, will be much less than perfect with imperfect results. By following any other path, you will be like a golfer who has learned the strokes the wrong way, and just because he practices, he thinks he will get better. In the case of this golfer, unfortunately, practice does not make perfect. By practicing over and over what he does wrong, he only reinforces and consolidates his imperfection. With this program, your practice time will be quality time, leading you along a pathway of high achiever perfection. The 30-day plan you will learn is cybernetic in nature. Cybernetics is the science of goal-striving systems that use feedback for corrective adjustment. On your 30-day plan, you will go through this cybernetic cycle. You will select and code into your nervous system a daily performance goal relating to your desired high achiever behavior. As you go through the day, you will attempt to center your performance to meet the requirements of the behavioral goal you set for yourself. During the evening, you will evaluate your day's performance or use your performance as feedback. Based on the information you glean from your performance evaluation, you will make mental corrections attempting to refine your behavior. Then, on the next morning, you will recode the desired performance and then proceed through the whole cycle of your performance evaluation, feedback of performance, correct and refine, until your behavior is a high achiever habit. This cassette will show you how to use, on a daily basis, corrective feedback, monitoring the difference between where you want to be and where you are, taking corrective action to get back on course, on a daily basis, for 30 days, to ingrain your desired behavior. First of all, it is vital to the success of the program that you keep your oxygenation relaxation skills conditioned. You should go through a complete tensing and detensing session at least once per week. Because you are going to be practicing your new behavioral habit for 30 days, you must establish a daily routine that will include a morning session to prepare for the coming day's activities and an evening session to critique and analyze, to refine your high achiever behaviors and to extinguish the not-so-good performance. And please remember, it's vital for you to realize that during the early stages of practice, you will have some successes and failures, and the failures are okay. It's vital, though, to be prepared to learn from your failures and get back on track. That's why the daily routine is essential. It allows you to use this cybernetic principle of positive and negative feedback. Let's look at your morning routine. Each morning, set aside 10 minutes, either before going through your regular wake-up routine of showering, dressing, and eating, or it can be afterwards. You figure out the time that will give you the most quiet and the least amount of interruption. Figure out what will be the best for you. You'll also need a comfortable place to sit or lie down. When you're settled, follow this routine. Close your eyes, and with an upper left eye shift code, activate from memory the colors red, orange, yellow, and green.
while you have access to the green-coded left brain, input with a lateral right eye shift code the verbal description of your behavioral goal and the consequences you will experience if you achieve it. Upper left eye shift code blue to gain access to your right brain. With an upper right eye shift code, construct your goal visualizing what you will look like when you've achieved it. Lateral right eye shift code. Construct the sounds you will hear that are associated with realizing your goal. Lower right eye shift code. Experience the body sensations you will feel when you reach your goal. Upper 10 degree central eye shift code. Experience a smell that you would like to associate with your goal achievement. Lower 10 degree central eye shift code. Experience a taste you would like to associate with your goal achievement. Lower left eye shift code. Experience the emotions you will feel when you accomplish your behavioral goal. Central focus. Now synthesize all of the senses associated with your goal and with great intensity activate all of the senses associated with your goal. Also in a central focus, activate the symbols of the high achiever and the demon Associate each with their corresponding behaviors. Now let's move to an upper left eye shift code and bring in the color violet, the color which activates the corpus callosum bridge between the left and right brain. Going to a central focus, pre-live in full sensory detail the events of the upcoming day, totally sensing your behavioral goal as if you have already accomplished it. Reverse your colors from violet, blue, green, yellow, orange to red. You have coded in your desirable performance, activated your high achiever and demon symbols, and now you are ready to face the day. During the day, you should continually be on the lookout for the demon stimulus. Whenever you are tempted to revert to your self-defeating behavior, activate with the central eye shift code your demon and high achiever symbols. Then engage them in a life and death battle. Develop a strategy that will ensure high achiever victory and the humility of defeat for the roach-like demon. Imagine every detail of the battle using all your senses, vision, sound, feel, taste, smell, and emotion. Practice this throughout the day whenever the stimulus that activates your self-defeating behavior presents itself. It should only take a minute or so to stage this mental confrontation. After work or in the evening when you've returned home, Set aside another ten minutes or so to review your day's performance regarding your behavioral goal. 
Go back to your relaxation place, close your eyes, and I shift code upper left and activate the colors red, orange, yellow, and green. In a central focus eye shift code, analyze your performance for that day. Pinpoint events when you succeeded in overcoming the demon and those events in which you were not successful. Going to an upper left eye shift code, recall the color blue. In the central focus position, relive the full sensory events of when you experienced the goal behavior, how you felt, associating and recalling all of the sensory elements that were present at the time. Still in the blue and central eye shift position, recall your failures in sensory detail the events in which the demon prevailed. Don't dwell on them, just recall the sensory events associated with them. With an upper left eye shift code, recall the color violet to gain access into the corpus callosum. With a central focus eye shift position, extinguish these failures each and every one, replacing them with corrected versions, as if the goal behavior prevailed. Remember, you have the power in your brain to do this easily. Now replay the events as if they were performed as you would have liked to perform them, in lucid, clear, sensory detail. What happens at this stage is that you are directing your neuropsychological metabolism to extinguish negative behaviors and replacing them with positive behaviors. This is the way habits are developed. The brain is actually unable to distinguish between real or perceived behavior. A sensory experience has as much value to your memory as a real experience does. When your imagination has sharpness and clarity, the message to the brain is sharp and clear. If you can liken your nervous system to branches on a tree, you can see that by pruning, you can direct the growth and direction of how that tree will be shaped over time. The same is true with your performance. By pruning self-defeating behaviors and replacing them with new positive habits, you become who you want to be. You are shaping your own growth just like a good gardener does for a tree or bush. You might find it useful to replay this cassette for the first couple of weeks as you establish your daily routine, both in the morning and evening. The important thing is to get used to going through the stages in a set pattern. If you feel comfortable with the morning part before breakfast, do it. If it's better after breakfast, after the shower, as you sit in your robe, do it then. The same goes for after work. Go through the regimen well before going to bed to avoid falling asleep. You might want to do the analysis just before dinner or shortly after, whichever is your cup of tea. The best thing, though, is to establish a pattern and remain faithful to it. On a daily basis during your 30-day program, let the following admonition of the ancient Greek philosopher and mathematician Pythagoras be your guide. Let not sleep fall upon thy eyes, till thou hast thrice reviewed the transactions of the past day. Where have I turned aside from rectitude? What have I been doing? What have I left undone, which I ought to have done? If you faithfully follow this 30-day discipline, your desirable high-achiever behaviors will become firmly rooted, rewarding, positive habit forces. Most of us have gone through some kind of self-improvement program. We began the program with the high expectations that we would be able to change our lives for the better. But after a few weeks of applying the principles of such a program, our tendency is to slowly fade the program out of our consciousness 
and resort back to our old ways of thinking and behaving. The problem is that most programs do not incorporate a sound plan to maintain and expand the personal changes once we have attempted to acquire them. In the Neuropsychology of Achievement program, we have developed a five-part strategy that will serve as your lifelong blueprint for maintaining and expanding your achievement behaviors. In this last cassette, we would like to tell you about it. It's not terribly long or complicated, but it is vital to your success in this program. The first step we recommend is that you work only on one behavior at a time. Research has told us that normal people concentrate best when they work on only one habit at a time. It requires high levels of concentration to keep the demon in check while allowing the high achiever within you to perform his or her duties. It also requires high levels of relaxation. If you are stuffing your learning system with several inputs, you're likely to suffer from overload and nothing gets accomplished. Work on acquiring only one habit at a time. Allow your new behavior to be developed over a period of 30 days. Step 2. Acquiring a new habit, conditioning behavior so that it is automatic, requires time and practice. Our experience indicates it takes a minimum of 30 days to establish an internal psychological and physiological metabolism that will allow a behavior to become an automatic response. Give it 30 days to work. In some cases, but not too many, it may take even longer. Take the time to do it right. If you haven't adequately acquired the habit over a 30-day period, try it again for another 30 days. Step 3. After you have acquired your new high achiever behavior or habit, select the next behavior. You have already sorted out your 3 by 5 cards and have priorities established for the goals you want to work on. Take the top ranked goal and begin setting up the program for making it a habit. You've got the success feeling from accomplishing your top ranked priority and that will give you confidence to go for the second goal. It may be helpful to do the card sort again because what sometimes happens is that your perspective and attitude may change ever so slightly after your first success. Do the card sort again and determine the next behavior you would like to acquire. Fourth, follow each of the steps we have recommended in the Neuropsychology of Achievement program just as you did with the first goal. If you feel it is necessary, replay for review the tapes from the beginning. And our fifth and last step. Make certain that at least once a week you verify the functioning of your initial goal habit, the first desirable behavior you conditioned into a habit. It has been newly added to your mind and body, and so keep a close eye on how well it's working for you. You don't buy a new car and forget about regular maintenance, and the same principle applies here. Give it some attention and care. It will run better for you. This simple five-step high achiever habit maintenance program will progressively propel you to full high achiever status if you let it. Keep working on it, and it will keep working for you. Now that we've come to the end of the Neuropsychology of Achievement program, we are going to retrace our steps in an effort to help you gain a total perspective of where we've been. It's like opening presents at Christmas or at a wedding or birthday. Sometimes you overlook a gift that has been tucked away in the packaging material, or maybe you just missed one completely in the excitement of the moment. We don't want you to overlook anything. First, you learned in this program that the power of visualization can be explained by modeling the function of the brain on holography. You learned that our sensory-rich images are products of an electrical and chemical process in our brain. If our images are filled with emotion and are rich in sensory detail, they possess the electromagnetic energy to influence our body, mind, and the concrete world in which we live. Through the power of three-dimensional sensory imagery, we become creators, and that which we sense becomes self-fulfilling prophecy. Second, you learn that your eye is an extension of your brain. Besides acting as the organ of vision, select patterns of eye movement open up pathways into your brain for the input and recall of sensory-rich images. You learn these eye movement positions along with their sensory counterparts. Third, you were introduced to a research-based model that detailed 21 dominant behaviors and habits common to high achievers. 
These characteristics were broken down into mental, emotional, physical, financial, and spiritual habits. Fourth, you compared yourself against the high achiever model and identified the high achiever habits you would like to possess. Fifth, you learned how to prioritize those habits and you selected one specific habit you would like to acquire within a 30-day period. You also learned how to develop sensory-rich goals and pre-live their consequences. Sixth, you were introduced to and mastered a powerful discipline that enabled you to program the desirable high achiever habit into your brain and nervous system. You learned in the first step of this process that it was necessary to clear tension and stress from your body in order to think clearly and to focus your power of sensory imaging. To do this, you learned a technique to automatically relax any muscle group in your body through the activation of a color and an eye movement. You then learned how to gain access to your holographic brain. You learned the method of programming that allowed you to input competent high achiever habits into your brain and nervous system. You also learned a simple yet powerful technique of self-discipline using the high achiever and demon symbols. You were then introduced to a 30-day plan of action that enabled you to internalize your sensory impression of achievement to make your high achiever behaviors a habit knit part of your nervous system. And finally, you were given a simple five-step plan, which if you followed, would serve as a lifelong blueprint and guide to help you maintain your desirable high achiever habits. This plan also would allow you to develop and refine new success characteristics and habits qualities that would allow you to literally achieve anything and everything you can sense. In conclusion, the aim of the Neuropsychology of Achievement program has been to give you a powerful personal tool to control your body and mind, your world and your destiny. Dr. William James, an early pioneer in self-help psychology, reflected our basic philosophy when he wrote, Man alone of all the creatures of the earth can change his own pattern. Man alone is the architect of his own destiny. Another aim of the Neuropsychology of Achievement program has been to show you how to incite your senses and emotions, how to fire your imagination with the desire to achieve and excel, and to give you a systematic plan for your ultimate success. The words of historian Arnold Toynbee capture the essence of this attempt. Apathy, he said, can be overcome only by enthusiasm, and enthusiasm can be aroused by two things, an idea which takes the imagination by storm and a definite plan for carrying out that idea into practice. And finally, the words of Jonathan Swift reflect the spirit which we attempted to impart to you in this program. Although men are accused of not knowing their own weaknesses, yet perhaps few know their own strengths. It is in men as in soils, where sometimes there is a vein of gold which the owner knows not of. We hope that the time we have spent together in the Neuropsychology of Achievement program has added a new, positive dimension to your life, a dimension rich in hope, vision, and achievement. And achievement.